Well, we can blame the weatherman for this one. They blew it, friends. There was supposed to be sunshine and a pleasant temperature today. The wind is kicking up, but there is no rain, although it did rain earlier. I'm Ken Bell, along with Will McDonough. We are at Mead Fields in Kingston, Rhode Island, and glad you're with us for Nesson's College Game of the Week. This is a good one because we've got two contrasting styles, but the, the main factor might be on the sidelines today. Andre Guerin, the outstanding running back for UNH, will not play today. Well, this is a terrible day for Andre Guerin. I mean, this is a career type of game. You wait your whole college career to play in a game that puts everything on the line, which is on the line here today when you get the Yankee Conference Championship and an automatic berth to the playoffs, and all of a sudden you come up, you get a kidney ailment, and the doctor says, listen, son, you can't play. You know, and, and what a heartbreak it has to be for him, and at the same time, for the University of New Hampshire, because they're already thin at running backs before that happened. That's right. They lost Orr, who is scheduled to go reconstruct knee surgery, I think, tomorrow. But they do have Scott Perry, who has really been a great backup all season long. Well, you just look at Scott Perry's numbers. He's played uh, five games this year, a lot of it in a backup role, some in the emergency role for Garrett. Every time he's gained 100 yards, New Hampshire does have a fine offensive line, but there's concern about Perry because uh, early in the week he was on crutches with a bad ankle, but yesterday the coaching staff said he ran well in practice. Got to be impressed with his Wildcat quarterback, Rich Byrne, runs that option play extremely well. Well, Rich Byrne uh, is different than Tom Earhart, the Rhode Island quarterback. <laughs> he can run the ball. He tries to run the ball. He looks like more of an all-around athlete. He is a threat with the run where Earhart really isn't, but Byrne is nowhere near the passer, and I don't think he can carry the load of the offense if something happens to their running game today. Tom Earhart, the second man in New England college history to go over 6,000 yards passing. Well, the stats say it all, but Earhart has got to perform today for the Rams to win. Well, again, this is the third time we will have seen him this year, and it's the third time where weather could pre uh, present a problem for him. Uh, two other games, it was rain today. I think it, it doesn't look like it's going to rain, although it has uh, in recent minutes down here, but it looks like the wind is going to kick up, and that could give him some problems. He's one of the great passes in New England history. He's one of the great touchdown throwers of all time in, in the United States in foot, college football. I think he has 75 for a career now, and he is the key guy in this game for Rhode Island. Brian Forster did not play last week with a, a shoulder bruise, but he's back today, 90% out on the field. Well, I think of all the players in the game and of all the players we have seen this year, the Brian Foster, the tight end for Rhode Island, is the best pro prospect. That's the way I feel about it, and I've watched pro football for 25 years. He's a very strong guy. He has great hands for a tight end. He runs well after he gets the football, and he can control a game. Uh, New Hampshire, in particular, has to pay attention to him and try to eliminate the short passes. Yankee Conference Showdown at stake, an automatic berth in the NCAA upcoming tournaments. And we'll be back with the opening kickoff on Nesson's College Football Game of the Week in just a moment. Ford Dealers presents 8.8 .8 Plus. 8.8 .8 annual percentage rate financing on 86 and 85 Tempo and Escort. Both when equipped with manual transmissions. Plus tough new 86 Rangers and sporty 86 Bronco 2s. Plus a special lease offer on all 86 and 85 Ford cars and light trucks. 1986 is off to a great start with 8.8 .8 Plus. and cowboy shoes, gift cards and high gear. Now you're talking country, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times and Strohs are spoken here. Strohs, fire brewed for smooth, consistent taste. Now you're talking Strohs, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times and Strohs are spoken here. Welcome back to Mead Stadium, Kingston, Rhode Island. Ken Bell with Will McDonough. Glad you're with us for this Yankee Conference showdown, and we're psyched for the game, and I'm sure that anybody who follows Yankee Conference football is also psyched. This is the big one. The series, the 61st meeting, 1905 being the first. Now, UNH leads 34-21-5. and five. UNH has won the last two, including last year. UNH 14 to 12, you remembered in that one that the Rams scored with a minute and a half left, but then failed in the two-point conversion to try to tie up the game. Last week's games, UNH beat Northeastern 35 to 21, and the Rams beat Lafayette 41 to 21. Now, UNH's only loss in the six and one record, the blemish came at the hands of Lafayette, the season opener 20 to seven. So those are the matchups that the two have played. All right, the officials. 
We will get those in, uh, shall we do the officials? Anthony Chambers, the referee. James Quirk, the umpire. Linesman, Milton Halstead. Line judge, George Aftow. And Robert Sokolowski will be the field judge. And Vincent Bocafuso will be the back judge. Then calling the game out of the stripes today. And the Rams won the toss of the coin, Will, but decided to take the win. So I think we'll see a wind be a big factor again today. There's Bob Griffin on the far sideline. Took off his trench coat. He's expecting the sun to come out today. Tim Tevens is one of the deep men back there. And the other, on the other side is Stan Harrison. And set to kick off is Mike Griffin. Actually, this is Paul Stringfellow who will boot it. In place of Griffin comes to Tevens at the six yard line. Takes it up the middle of the field. The line forms, but he is greeted at the 20 and brought down. So it's first and 10 at the 20 yard line. And UNH has its first opportunity going against the wind. And Ty was the tackler on the play. On offense, the Rams, Earhart and Morris in the backfield. Uh, I beg your pardon, uh, we'll get, get to that in just a moment. It'll be UNH with the football first here. It's the I formation, you see Perry behind Schreiner. A slot to the right side, and now Schreiner steps over just a bit, and the pitch comes to Perry. Might be gone, he might be gone. Down the sideline, 50. 45 and slips and falls down at the 42 yard line. Guy Carbone was back there, but did he break that one open on the first play? Well, what happened is Rhode Island threw everybody in the line of scrimmage. They threw 11 men up there and say, okay, let's see you run against the 11 men. Now, Rhode Island's got 11 men in the line of scrimmage, so once he gets outside Scott Perry behind the block from Shrine at 31, he is gone. There's nobody there. And he takes up off the field, and he runs all the way to the New Hampshire 36-yard line. But if that was Andre Garin, he's standing in the end zone. 44-yard gain on the opening play from scrimmage. First and 10, 37, Schreiner up the middle. And he'll get three on the play before Mark White can make the stop. Well, how's that for a fine how-do-you-do? Do? Well, it's a how-do-you-do to Coach Bob Griffin of Rhode Island. He probably thought, hey, we'll shake him up right away. We'll throw it. We'll throw 11 guys up there and see what they can do with it. And they showed it. They, they get up a 40-yard run to start the ball game. Action just on the way. This is the third play of the game. And UNH in good field position here. Second down and seven. Ball at the 33-yard line. Rich Byrne calling the signals. Hand off to Perry. Tries the left side over guard and tackle and moves down to the 29-yard line. Perry taking over for Andre Guerin and Perry on crutches earlier this week with a bad ankle sprain, but now he's in the lineup, and there's not much depth, as we call there. Rich Byrne, the six-foot, 190-pound junior, setting the team, passing 52 for 104, 638 yards and four TDs on the season. Here's the pitch, Perry going to the right side, and he is booted at the 30-yard line and brought down by Damon Hewlett, the outstanding linebacker for the Rams. That'll make it fourth down and three, and we'll see what UNH chooses to do. Well, I think they got to go for it here because you're really in fourth down territory. You know, you're not going to punt from the 28 yet. The wind is too strong to try a field goal. I was surprised at that call. They had run effectively for the first two downs straight ahead, Ken. And then you knew you had two more downs to get three yards, and you run a sweep on a slick field. Perry couldn't cut back. I think you'll see something straight ahead. Fourth down and three. Schreiner flanked by Perry, dotting the eye. The flag is out. They use too much time. You see Burn. The play will be called back. A delay of game, and that's costly. Now it's fourth and eight. <laughs> Referee Anthony Chambers makes the call to the far sideline. Sellout crowd here. Nearly 12,000 will be on hand as soon as everyone gets into the ballpark. Well, that's a real tough break for New Hampshire. For, for two reasons, it, it knocks them uh, back where they got a third and eight or a third and nine. And you almost have to throw the ball. But beyond that, it showed what you were going to do on fourth down. They were going to run a bootleg with the quarterback. Now they could have come back and changed their play. Let's see what Bill Bowles calls this time as you saw him on the sideline there. Blitz, burn, over the middle, pass is incomplete. The pass intended for Glenn Matthews, dropped. Pat Lawson was back defending on the play. That's a big drop, Will. He had the ball. He had the ball, and he had the first down, and he might have uh, gotten down to about the 15 or 10. He goes back. Excellent protection here. New Hampshire blitzes. Watch Perry pick up 
Eulen. Now he waits. Vern does. Throws across. his Matthews clearing right in his hand. Had the first down because he was only about three yards from the marker. And unfortunately just dropped the ball. Great break. The last three or four plays for Rhode Island. Tommy Earhart with the first call of the afternoon. Doug Haynes is in the backfield. The lone setback. Again, two tight ends and two split ends. Hand off to Haynes on the draw play. He has running room over the 40. Over the 48-yard line and down at the 49 before Eric Thompson can neck time at that point. And it's good for a first down, a 14-yard pickup. <laughs> and here's the URI offense with Earhart and Morris. Actually, Haynes got the start today. Donfield, DiMaggio, Forster, and Riley. And there you look at the offensive front. Jensen, Jensen, DeProspero, Storr, and White. First and 10. 15-yard pickup on the opening play by Haynes. Now Earhart again the draw play, and Haynes this time no fooling around to the 50-yard line. Paul Belay would not be suckered a second time, and he takes care of it. Well, I think that's two excellent calls in a row, even though the second one didn't work. It was the same play by the Rhode Island coaching staff, but I, I'll tell you what their thinking was, Ken, this. First of all, you know, they know New Hampshire's going to defend them for the pass, so you make it look like a pass, and your coaching staff upstairs sees what New Hampshire's going to do on pass defense, but you don't have to throw the ball to find out, so they did it two times in a row, looking at their different coverage. Now they get an idea of what New Hampshire's going to do on pass defense. Damian Riley is split to the near side. Earhart has yet to throw the ball. Second down and nine. This time he'll throw it. Two-step drop back off to the left side. The pass is caught by Tony DiMaggio at the 40-yard line, and Neil Zahn Frelli pulls him down at the 39. Now, DiMaggio had broken ribs earlier this season. He's the seventh player to go over 1,000 yards in receiving for the Rams. 6'4", 216-pound senior. Broken arm last year in this UNH game. As a matter of fact, he was tackled by Tim Tevens and was very anxious to see Mr. Tevens this afternoon. I think you'll see a lot of them because Stevens is one of the outstanding uh, defensive backs in the Yankee Conference. Player of the year last year in the Yankee Conference, Stevens. First down, 10 yards to go. Ball at the 39. Earhart wants to throw, looking over the middle. Plenty of time. Now, rifles the ball down the field. It is caught by Damian Riley cutting across. And Stan Harrison rides him down at the 22-yard line. And, Will, I think we're going to see a lot of offense today. Well, you're certainly going to see a lot of offense from Tom Earhart right here. He's got a little bit of pressure. He sidestepped. Watch him slide right here in the pocket. Straightens up. Sees his man coming across the middle. Makes a beautiful throw because number 12 for New Hampshire, Stan Harrison has great coverage on him, but Damian Riley makes one heck of a catch coming across the middle. 18-yard gain. 10.40 remaining. Scoreless first period. Rams on the move. First down, 10 yards to go. Ball at the 22. Earhart to throw again. Over the middle. Pass picked off nicely by Tom Cooper. Tom is right there to pull it out of the hands of the intended receiver. Nice play at the 21. Well, Earhart's, try Earhart's trying to hit Foster right here, and Earhart's going to beef, and he does to the official, but there's interference on the play. Now, this is a simple hook pattern. There's Earhart turning around. Watch the uh, Sparrows come back inside, step in front of him, and make the catch. Now, Brian Foster, rather, is, runs the hook, turns around after the play, went to the official, said, hey, listen, he was holding me up. I couldn't run my route the way I wanted to. Two turnovers have stopped drives here, the opening two drives of the ball game. And now UNH with the football handoff is Scott Perry. And Scott is down almost at the line of scrimmage. Mark White makes the stop on the play. White with 30 tackles on the season, 212-pound senior for the Rams, anchoring that left end. Second down, eight yards to go. An exciting first quarter so far. These two teams gunning for each other since the middle of the season when they knew this would be the Yankee Conference showdown. I formation, pitch, Perry, right, and tripped up at the 22. Pat Lawson makes the tackle, and there's the man who had the interception, Dick Asperis. He's a happy man. Third down, seven yards to go. So far, it's been Perry left, Perry right. Well, it normally is when you're uh, running an eye formation, your tailback does the work, but obviously what Rhode Island's doing here is they're defensing them to the outside ever since that first play, and they can't get outside. Split backfield this time, Perry and Schreiner. And Byrne wants to throw. Flip! And pulled down behind the line of scrimmage. Well, Brad Carson was leading the attack. I bet your partner was Pat Lawson. 
Lawson was the man who first came in and put the pressure on the linebacker. Well, knowing Byrne is not very experienced, this is his first year playing quarterback. They give him different things to look at. This time it's a blitz. Lawson comes from the outside. There's number 15. New Hampshire doesn't have adequate pass protection to handle the extra guys coming in. And, and as a result, Lawson makes the play. And now you got a tough job for the punter here to do to kick into the win. This is a strong win today. And Tom Flanagan got his work cut out for him. Flanagan standing at the one yard line, and Brian Forster is one of the deep men. And Bob Donfield is the other man. Ball is in the air at the 46 and bounces to the 50-yard line. Will be down. Great field position for the Rams, and we've seen a few raindrops coming down. It rained pretty heavily here for just a short time before the ball game this morning. The sun came out briefly, a few patches of blue, but now the wind is causing a little havoc on the field. 35-yard punt by Flanagan. I think it'd be uh, important to mention right here, Ken, that. Coach Bob Griffin of Rhode Island said yesterday that in the past two years, or ever since he's installed this type of wide open passing attack, primarily for Tom Earhart, the Rhode Island passer, that New Hampshire has done the best job of defensing this offense. That's right. It is the only one that has really done a very good job. And last year, the big game at this time of year was at New Hampshire. Again, they were both going for the Yankee Conference title. New Hampshire won 14 to 12. And Griffin, I thought it was an interesting statement, there he is right there in the picture, for Coach to make, admitted that the New Hampshire defensive scheme had him and his coaching staff and his team on the field confused for almost all of the ball game. The different calls they made on first down, second down, third down. And Griff said, hey, we really didn't give Tom Earhart much of a hand when we played New Hampshire a year ago. We hope to give him a lot more today. Matter of fact, when I talked with Griff on Thursday in his office, he didn't know exactly what the offensive scheme would be today. He's and he really has it off his hands incomplete. Defending on the play, Eric Thompson and Stan Harrison are back. Double coverage on Riley. Quick drop in the quick delivery on that one. While he was getting pressure from the outside from De Gasparis. I mean, the play before when Rhode Island had the ball, he made the interception downfield. This time they, they lined him up, number six, from the outside. And when Brian Foster, the tight end, released downfield, instead of going with him as he had during the game, he took off and pass rushed. Tom Earhart has won three gold helmets this season, sets him up. Second down, 10 yards to go. Quick drop over the middle, pass intended for Brian Forster is batted out of his hands. Nice play by Neil Zonfrelli, the outstanding linebacker, and Eric Thompson is also there. Zonfrelli, all-conference, and New England wrestling champ in 84. Tom Gasparis having the game of his life here. He was the rusher on the play. Well, I think New Hampshire might be looking at this, and maybe we, we found something now. That's two times in a row. Number six, D. Gasparis has blitzed from the outside. Nobody's picked him up, and it has been uh, forced to throw the ball before he wanted to. Third down, 10 yards to go. Ball nose deep inside the 50-yard line. Earhart to throw. Over the middle pass. Incomplete attendant for DiMaggio. Brings up a fourth down, and the Rams will have to punt the ball away. So the Wildcats do the job on defense. Scott Curtis is the defender on the play. Earhart, two for six, passing 28 yards. With this position in the field and the importance of the game, you think Rhode Island might fool around here a little bit with a fake punt or something like that. Bob Donfield boots it high in the air, and it comes down over the head of Eric Thompson and will be down at the four-yard line. It's Jim Donnelly on the punt. I beg your pardon. Jim Donnelly punting as a 37-yard average. That time, 46 yards, and he pins UNH down deep. Taking a look at the... UNH offense, Byrne, Schreiner, and Perry in that backfield. Robichaud, Farrell, and Flanagan are the receivers. Saranovitz, who's outstanding. Bumpus, Default, Ciccone, and Driscoll across that front. And it's first and 10 from their own three-yard line. Byrne sets the Wildcats up. Schreiner flanked by Perry, handoff Perry. Over the top of Schreiner and out to the eight-yard line. Guy Carbone makes the stop on the play. Rams defense up front. White, Carson, Poland, Landry, and Tunnell. Hewlett and Lawson are the two linebackers. And in that secondary, outstanding. Williams, Carbone, Cassidy, and Watson back there. 
Second down, five yards to go. Ball just inside the 10-yard line. Hearn looks over the defense. Long signal count. Pitch to Perry. He is tripped up behind the line and falls maybe to the 10-yard line. Jim Landry is there to make the stop. Now, Phil Mulcahy, who is normally the start riding tackle, has a shoulder sprain suffered against Lafayette. He's out about a month, Will. They hope he'll be back in time for the playoffs, but that time Landry shows that he's prepared to play today. Third down and four. Ball again at the 10-yard line. 6.57 remaining in a scoreless first period. Glad you could be with us for Nesson's College Game of the Week today. They hand off to Perry Burton. Will keep and will be brought down behind the line of scrimmage by Guy Carbone who was blitzing from the strong safety spot, and boy, was he in there in a hurry, Will. Well, Rhode Island has done an excellent job of defense in New Hampshire to the outside since the first play, and that's what their defense has concentrated on doing in the past two series. Now, I'm surprised that uh, New Hampshire just doesn't line up, run straight ahead, almost guard to guard, and it's banging away because the field is a little bit slippery, and it's tough to run outside and make a good cut. Tom Flanagan will get off his second punt. 35 yards on the first punt. And this one's high up in the air. And Guy Carbone just watches it fall in front of him about five yards away, and then it is down at the 47. Well, a number of injury problems today by both ball clubs, but people are playing with pain out there, knowing how important this is. Brian O'Neill has a sprained neck, and he's about 70% out there at left tackle on that UNH defense, but nothing could keep him out of this game, according to the coaching staff. He's a senior. He wants to go, off, go for it all. Tommy Earhart sets them up now, first and 10 from the 47-yard line. Lone setback this time is Brian Morris. Earhart throws over the middle. Tomasio double hit at the 44-yard line. A ball in the air. Now you see it. Now you don't see me. Scott Curtis was there to put the hammer on. What you're seeing is better pressure on Tom Earhart than we've seen him have this year. New Hampshire has put the pressure on him virtually on every play. Here's DiMaggio, number 10. The ball is a little high, and here you have two linebackers making a sandwich. That's Don Ferrelli coming in there. He's a very active player, the most active player on the New Hampshire defense. Five straight out the passes. There you see the encouragement being shouted from the near sideline. Wildcats. Second down, 10. Earhart to throw. Pressure again. This time the screen pass coming off to Doug Haynes. Over the 45. Inside the 40. Still on his feet to the 30. And down to the 28-yard line. Stan Harrison and Tom DeGasparis finally pull him down at the 28. This play illustrates how you handle pressure. We said he was getting pressure. They say, okay, give us some more pressure, and we're going to dump the screen pass on you. Look how poised he was. Air hop, he threw it out, he threw it out here to Haynes. A ball of a block is in front of him. Makes a nice selection with his cut back before. One, maybe two tackles away from taking it to the end zone. 19 yards on the gain. Screen pass to Haynes. First and 10, 526 remaining. Scoreless first period. Earhart marks them out. Drops back. Good protection this time. Oh, he throws to the left side, and Donfield was nowhere near it. There's a flag on the far sideline. Right at the line of scrimmage. Looks like it may go against the Rams. Looks like Earhart was throwing the ball into a, a zone out there, and Donfield had cut inside instead of going outside. Yeah, the play is a little mix-up all around the field in the play. I think the uh, penalty is going to be called against DiMaggio, one of the tight ends for Rhode Island. I think he pushed off Tim T. No, excuse me. Came off the ball too quick and uh, was offside. Tevens was playing up on him. You know, they've been having a little confrontation over there all day long. Anybody who lines up there with Tevens, you know, he is a physical player. He likes to get up in their face and, and tries to make them work. And that time, DiMaggio left him too soon and was offside. Zon Frelli is on the bench putting on another pair of socks. Maybe his ankle was retaped. Scott Curtis is in the game at linebacker. Zon Frelli putting both his socks back on. He should be back in the game soon. Second down, 10 yards to go. Tommy Earhart pumps. Now throws it out there and is caught beautifully by Haynes at the six-yard line. Well, again, 
Haynes coming out of that backfield, Will, and he took him down the far sideline and found him. You can't Laid him right in there. Well, that's it. You, you said it, Kenny. You can't throw the ball any better than this. Haynes comes out. He's being covered by a linebacker, Dave Duggan. But Duggan does a great job. He's with him on a step to step. But he lays the ball right in there between the linebacker and the two safety men, DBS Barris being one of them, waiting for him downfield. But, of course, he had to take the hit to make the play. 21-yard passing play. First and goal from the six-yard line. Earhart to throw, pumps once, over the middle, pass, up in the air, and incomplete. Three Wildcats had an opportunity to intercept, and no one could quite find the handle. Scott Curtis was one of them. Oh, Eric Thompson had the first shot at it. I mean, you know, he Earhart has good time. He tries to throw it in there, hard, sees a little seam. Now watch 39, Scott Thompson, whoop, tips it away. <laughs> Duggan takes a shot at it, back to Thompson, he can't get it. Everybody takes, and it hits the ground. It would have been a great turnover for New Hampshire in this situation to get him back out to the 20 and get him the ball. Instead, it's a big break for Rhode Island. Second down goal from the six. Earhart again, back into the pocket. Now looks to the right side, fires the ball, and is overthrown, intended for Damian Riley. Actually had Forster over there also, but Riley was closer to the ball. Third down and six. Now you live with the pass. But would you uh, maybe mix it up with a running play this close? Well, Ken, this is when it's tough to pass because, you know, you, you can't run through the back of the end zone. The defense knows this. It's much easier to play pass defense inside your own 10-yard line because you don't have to worry about the guy going deep. So you jump right on the receiver, and this makes it tough to get in there. Yes, I might do something. I might hit a back coming out of the backfield. I might run a draw play. Earhart's four for 12 so far in the ball game. He'll throw it up again. There's this big rush. Here's the spin pass. Brian Morris drops it. Well, Morris was so wide open, I'm sure he was thinking six points at the time and just couldn't couldn't hang on to it. Yeah, Brian had every reason to think of six points. But he <laughs> is wide open. This time the screen is set to the left. Watch 43. Brian Morris slip out. Watch his head turn upfield. See him? He says, oh, my God, what did I do? He had the blocker with him. Would have been in the end zone for a touchdown, but instead Rhode Island now has to line up and try a field goal to get on the board first. Bob Donfield will hold, and the coach's son, Mike Griffin, will attempt a field goal from the 14, it's a 24-yarder. Rams trying to crack the scoreboard first. Nearly an offsides, but one of the Wildcats gets back. Ball is up, and it is good. And with 4.30 remaining in the first period of play, the Rams strike first with the 24-yard field goal by Griffin. Three-nothing score. Well, we've seen both offenses move the ball all over the field so far, Will, but just three points on the scoreboard. And the Wildcats have got to feel good about at least holding the Rams out of the end zone. Well, there's a good decision been made here, Ken. We mentioned at the top of the broadcast, Rhode Island uh, had the chance to get the ball right away. It chose to take the win. That will kick off. We'll pin uh, New Hampshire in. And they had them pinned in most of the uh, first period so far. And after the third try of getting the ball in good field position, inside the 50, they finally took it down and got some points out of it. But you have to admire <laughs> New Hampshire's defense. You know, they have a number one ranking against the pass, and they've shown here today why they do have it. Well, we see a, we see a very special players come out on the field. We had no idea this guy was going to be out here, but uh, he's taking a little of the thunder away. <laughs> That's one of the secret weapons Bill Bowes was talking about out there, I guess, on returning the ball. Tim Tevens and Stan Harrison are the two deep men, and Paul Stringfellow tees it up. We'll kick it off. 3-0, URI with the lead. Turnovers, good defense, the story of the game so far. And Stringfellow boots it, it comes out of bounds on the near sideline. The Stringfellow normally kick off. Actually, they've had Mike Griffin all season. Stringfield has kicked off some. The interesting thing, Will, last year, Stringfield was the one who missed an extra point when it was a 14-6 ball game and forced the Rams to go for that two-point conversion, which they missed, and eventually lost the game 14-12. And Paul Stringfellow perhaps just wants to... I mean, this is a great game for him to get back in after last year's disappointment and prove himself here. Well, I know he's smarter than Mike Griffin because at least he got a, a shoe on today. <laughs> Imagine kicking barefooted today, the grass is wet, 
It's cold as heck out there. I wouldn't want to make contact with that football no matter what. That's true. Five-yard walk-off. Now a kick from the 35. This is a high end-over-end kick. Coming down at the 20-yard line, Mike Schweiner has the ball to the 25, and he puts his head down and gets it out to the 34-yard line. Mike Schreiner is a three-year starter and a, basically a blocker. He only has touched the ball 72 times for 342 yards, and yet he's played every down out there. He's one of those unsung heroes that you like to talk about. If I were the New Hampshire coaching staff and Bill Bowes, he'd start touching it right now because I think this is his type of day. Get him up front as the up back. Let him hit that line of scrimmage head on and fast, and let's see what happens. A slot to the right side. Hand off Perry right behind Schreiner, and he moves it over to 35 out to the 36-yard line. And the scoring drive, seven plays, 41 yards on the march, and consuming about 31, and a 23-yard field goal by Griffin, the difference so far. Mike Jansen is the defender on the play. Now, Jansen is going both ways today because of the thinning out over injuries along that defensive front line. He's the offensive guard and the defensive tackle today. Fake handoff to Perry. Burn rolls to the right side on the option. He has a man all alone, but overthrows him at the 37-yard line. Glenn Matthews was all alone, but I think perhaps Burn was looking further down the field, Will. Well, New Hampshire can throw the ball anytime it wants to today, and it's going to have people over. Because as you see and hear, uh, if you get a wide shot here, they, you know, Rhode Island has nine men committed to the line of scrimmage. And once Burns starts to run around, all kinds of things are over. There's no coverage here on Matthews, number 18. Right. Okay, no coverage whatsoever. I don't know, he should have read it a little bit better. I think once he made the break, if he came to the middle of the field, he would have gave Burns much more of a target to throw to. Third down, seven, fake handoff to Perry. Plenty of time back there. Lost the ball incomplete, intended for Tom Flanagan as tight end. Guy Carbone and Pat Lawson were over defending on the play. Brings up a fourth down and seven. 340 remaining, and there's a big factor right there. Andre Guerin, this has to be killing him to be on the sidelines today, Will. That's why they took him out of uniform. I think if he put a uniform, they want to try to run. He'd want to go in there. <laughs> Again, we repeat, Andre Guerin, you see him there in street clothes, number 35 in New Hampshire. They're great running back, the best they've ever had at New Hampshire. A record breaker, couldn't play today because of a kidney ailment. And they're hopefully they're going to try to get him back for the last two games in the season, but they don't know yet if they can. Tom Flanagan, two punts, 36.5 average. He's averaging 32.7 on the season. This time, Paul gets a URI bounce out to the 40-yard line before he's downed. And the Rams take over, first and 10 from the 40, leading 3-0. 331 remaining here in the first period of play. It's a punt they didn't need, Ken. 23 yards from the line of scrimmage. Exactly. You know, that was one that you really wanted right there to try to back up Rhode Island, take the ball away from quickly, and hope that you can establish good uh, field position because New Hampshire, since the first play of the game, has not had a first down. They hit big with a 40-yard run on the first play of the game, and they haven't had a first down since. Good point. 24-yard punt. 40-yard line, first and 10. Man, I think the Rams have used too much time. And that will cost them five yards. Tommy Earhart last year, 322 yards passing against UNH in that 14 to 12 loss. Bob Griffin felt that last week in the win over Lafayette at homecoming when he had the five touchdown passes that Earhart's arm was really back, Will, because he had been bothered because of the uh, bruised hip the hip pointer for much of the season, earlier in the uh, season. And his arm just wasn't quite there, but he felt last week he was really starting to see Tom Sparkle. And I think today we've seen him very accurate. Oh, he's strong today. He's been a little bit wild high. I mean, he's been overthrowing the ball, which is a sign your arm is in good shape. <laughs> Hand off to Brian Morris, and a penalty marker is down, and this one will probably be a holding call. Well, the flag came right over the center. Scott Curtis is there and it looked like maybe white looks like maybe bob white was responsible boy the flag came out immediately bob white's been their best offensive uh, tackle all right. season coach bob griffin and staff feels that he should be a candidate for all american honors at this level and certainly one of the, the top three for on, offensive Jack. performance uh performance on his team so far this season 
New Hampshire's done a mob, excuse me, Rhode Island all year long has done a marvelous job of pass protecting for Earhart without getting in a lot of trouble. Now, that's, that's right. The, that's the irony of that play. They get called for holding on a run where they very rarely get called <laughs> for holding and pass protection. That's right. White can bench 440 pounds, is certainly a pro prospect. First down, 25 yards to go. Earhart over the middle. The pass is caught by Brian Forster at the 41-yard line. And Dave Duggan pulls him down. Now, Forster with his first reception of the afternoon, again with that shoulder problem, did not play last week. It's a typical Tom Earhart to Brian Forster pass. Five-step drop, set, sets up, has good protection. He comes down, eludes the linebacker. Duggan's been with him all day, but he can't stay with Forster. 58, Brian Duggan, and Forster... Excellent pair of hands. Even on a cold day like today, he's the guy that normally will catch the ball for you. Good look at the tight end. Earhart. Second down, eight yards to go. Getting the rush, and Hip drops the football, and the Wildcats have recovered at the 34. Earhart was blindsided that time. Brian O'Neill was the man making the recovery, and Jerushchuk, Ilya Jerushchuk, was in there, and he was the man who wrapped him up and forced the fumble. Watch Jerushchuk now. He's going to come from the left-hand side of his screen. Earhart doesn't see him. He gets him from the blind side. Watch him, 46. He wraps him up, and when he does, he hooks the ball out of his arm right there. Now comes the recovery by Brian O'Neill. New Hampshire has great field position. This is the big break they can use. You saw the frustration on Brian Morris's face as he missed the block coming around that side. Here's Perry. He puts his shoulder down and moves to the 30-yard line. And now we see a little rain starting to fall, and it's coming right at us, Will, so I think the, the, the wind is blowing directly across the field from the home stand toward us. Perry, nine carries, 66 yards so far in the ball game. Two minutes left in the first period. 3-0, URI leads. Second down, five yards to go at the 30. Byrne calls him out. And off Perry, left side, opening down to the 23-yard line. That should be good for a first down. I should be the offensive coordinator for New Hampshire in this game, right? <laughs> That's what I said the last series they should do is just run the same. They have run this play effectively. I bet they've averaged five yards a crack when they line up in the I formation and just run off left guard and left tackle and bang away at it. And there's two straight tries. That's their first first down since the first play of the ball game. Boy, and talk about a great offensive line working in front of Garen all season, now working in front of Perry. It's first down, 10 yards to go at the 23. Perry again, left side. Another opening inside the 20, down to the 17. Well, he's really getting some work out there by Saranovitz, the all-conference redshirt senior on the left tackle side. Jim Bumpus, Paul Default up front, Tony Ciccone and John Driscoll. They're just blowing people out of there. Second down and three yards to go with a minute six remaining in the first period. UNH with its deepest penetration. Schreiner is the fullback. And he gets the handoff. And oh, he bowls his way down to the six yard line. There is a lot of power there in that 5'10", 220 pound body. Mentioned. That's what we mentioned. Uh, that was his first carry of the game, I believe. And I thought that if they gave it to him, Second carry of the game is too, if they gave it to him on that up back in the eye formation, he would hit there quick straight ahead. He would be in business. I really think if New Hampshire stays at it, bangs away, tackle a tackle, runs straight ahead, they can move the football uh, today. First and goal from the seven yard line. Schreiner again, inside the five, down to the four. Twenty seconds remaining in the period. This may be the last play of the first period. Mike Jansen, who is in at right defensive tackle, makes the stop on the play. There's a good look at Schreiner. If New Hampshire is smart, and that's what they're doing, New Bill Boys is, is pointing. I don't know why he wants to call oh. timeout here. They take a timeout, and maybe they panicked, thinking that the uh, 25 seconds would elapse. But no, it wasn't because, they, you know, at the end of that play, I looked at the scoreboard, there was only 22 seconds 22. left in the quarter. If they let it run down, you know, they'd be out of the quarter. You certainly would want to take the wind if you're going to go in for a score at the other end of the field. Of course, you have an opportunity down here. You don't want to do anything to jeopardize it, so might as well think about it. 
Stay tuned to Nesson later this evening for live Bruins hockey. Tonight, the Bruins host the Chicago Blackhawks from the Boston Garden. Our exclusive coverage begins at 6.30 with Bruins Digest, followed by all the action at 7 o'clock. The Bruins and the Blackhawks tonight, live and only here on Nesson, where we deliver Ken Bell with Will McDonough. Hey, the Bruins are playing some kind of hockey, aren't they? Aggressive, and Butch well, Boyd seems to have them going. Yeah, going uh, has them going well. They've changed the offense this year. You can see, by the way, they're scoring goals. If you remember back to a year ago, they had a lot of uh, difficulty at the beginning of the season. Right. Scoring goals uh, this year. Charlie Sim is up there, scored as many as uh, anybody in the league. It's been great. And I think they'll have an exciting season. The key to their season is keeping people healthy. Right. And of course, Peters and Keynes have both been great in goal. Now, Schreiner's out of the game here. That's unusual. This close to the goal line. Derek Milton is the new fullback. Here's the pitch to Perry around the left side to the two to the goal line. Touchdown. Scott Perry using Derek Milton, the 210-pound sophomore, as the man in front clearing the path, and the touchdown comes with three seconds left in the period. You can see a happy Scott Perry on the sideline. Simple power pitch. Pitch to Scott Perry coming to his left. The whole offensive, this is like a student body left, the old <laughs> USC day. Everybody gets in front of the ball, there, gets a block from Chuck Milton, number 40, lowers his head, and takes it right into the end zone. He had a three-yard run upfield before anybody get near him. Eric Facey will attempt to tag on the extra point. And he does. And with three seconds remaining in the first period, 7-3, New Hampshire takes the lead. Impressive drive after the turnover. New Hampshire, great defensive effort in the first period. Backed up against its uh, own goal line and its own end of the field for most of the first 15 minutes. Only gives up three points. Then they come back down and get the touchdown. You're going to see it right here. Scott Perry, 27, takes the pitch, turns it up between left guard and left tackle. Everybody's cleared out, puts his head down near the goal line, drives for the strike, puts the ball in, and he's got the touchdown. Throughout most of that drive, New Hampshire ran very well to its left. And they seem to have established something running to the left. And, of course, on that left side, the Rams have been pretty well beaten up you know this is why <laughs> you got to kick off into the wind that's right you know if you waited and you went down the other side and you scored with the wind at your back then you come up field and you kick off with the wind and eric facey watches the ball fall off the tee that shows you how much wind there is out there jerry williams and doug haynes are the two deep men standing inside the 10 yard line three seconds remaining in the first period sun is more or less peeking through the clouds here there you see Facey booted away coming down short taken at the 30 I'll make it the 27 yard line and out of bounds immediately Jim happy is the man who finally gets the football and so it's first and ten Rams with two seconds remaining in the period Jim happy Well, we'll see what Tom Earhart can do on this drive. But Island coach, uh, coaching staff won't be happy with happy because it looked as though if he let that ball go, it might have been out of bounds, and they might have had better field position, certainly, than their own 25-yard line. Very true. Earhart sets them up now. Brian Morris is the setback. Riley is split wide in the near side. Don Field left. Earhart wants to throw over the middle, looks for four. Wide open to the 40, to the 45 and out of bounds at the 47-yard line. That is the end of the first period of play. And New Hampshire has a 7-3 lead over the URI Rams. will return with the second period from Meade Stadium in just a moment. Bobby, it's almost 10. And I used to think the hockey life was fast. At home and away, 80 games a year. But at the end of the season, you had five months to unwind. Today, I don't have five minutes. Be right back. The Bay Banks card. It's good at Express 24s wherever you look at money supply machines in stores and supermarkets, and at Cirrus locations from here to Hawaii. No wonder it's the number one bank card in Massachusetts. You can rely on it. Thank you very much. Oh, may I have a receipt, please? Can I have your autograph, please? Sure. 
the Baybanks card. What are you waiting for? New Hampshire, seven. Rhode Island, three, as we get set for the second period of play from Mead Stadium, Ken Bell, along with Will McDonough. Earhart, six for 15, 107 yards on the afternoon. Rams trailing on the scoreboard. Now they have it first down and 10 at their own 46. Earhart to throw, has four score again. Inside the 40, the 35, slips and falls down at the 32. Back defending on the play, Eric Thompson. That might be a bad spot on the field. Remember, we had a slip there before. Two in a row, Earhart to Foster coming across the middle, and two times in a row, the man covering him fell down. It was two different oh. guys. The play before, it was Ted White, 38, and this time it was Gigas Ferris, number six, who had him coming across the field and, and slipped and fell down. That's why he was so wide open to make two long catches. First down, 10 yards to go. Ball inside the 35 at the 34-yard line. Forster, three catches now, 59 yards in the afternoon. Earhart looking over the middle again. Forster has it, and he bowls his way down to about the 27-yard line. Forster had three people on top of him, still made the catch and got another couple of yards. Tom DeGas Ferris and Ted White were the two defenders. Well, they're using five in that defensive backfield, Will, and they're trying to scatter people to cover the onslaught of four receivers going out. But so far, Forster has been able to, to make the play. Second down and three. Ball at the 27 as Earhart fakes. Launches the ball for Riley. Damien has got the football out of bounds. Damian Riley was right there with Stan Harrison. Harrison had the football, but they were both out of bounds. Well, he was being double covered back there. This was great, great coverage. I'll tell you what happened. The play before, Damian Riley ran a sideline and up, and there was only single coverage, and he came open. But Earhart had thrown underneath the Forster. He went over the sideline, said something to Bob Griffin, ran in, and then the call was to him on the same play. But this time, he was well covered by Stan Harrison. Third down, three. Ball at the 27. Earhart drops. Has his man, Bob Donfield, inside the 15, down to the 13-yard line. Bob Donfield, the little-used sophomore on that left side, makes the catch before Neil Sonfrelli and Tim Tevens can defend him. He is what you would call a hidden man out of there. He's only had 26 catches on the season, that being his 27th. 228 yards and two touchdowns. Obviously, the right side is Earhart's favorite side, but comes up with a big play there. Well, Donfield, you remember, can play very well in the game we had at BU. He had 67 right. catches that day. First down and 10. Ball at the 18-yard line. Earhart drops. Now he'll gun the pass for Riley. Touchdown! Damian Riley over the middle. And he is right there. Earhart puts it in beautifully. Pinpoints the pass. And Riley beats Stan Harrison. A great throw because he has to throw over, I believe it's one of the linebackers. Watch the flight of the ball. Riley set out to the screen, runs a post inside, and you couldn't see it too well, but one of the linebackers tried to jump up and get a piece of it. He had to throw the ball up a little bit. That's why Riley had to go up a little bit and get it, but it was a perfect throw by Tom Earhart. Damian Riley had four touchdown passes last week. That's his first one of the afternoon. There you see Mike Griffin, the barefooted kicker launches the ball off the tee and it is good and with 13 18 remaining in the first uh, half 10 to 7 your eye takes well, the lead if you're the safety man like eric thompson tom d Gasparis, this is what it looked to you there air hot back has great protection riley's coming down the field see the ball go over the outstretched arm the one of the defender takes it in stride and he's in the end zone and he has the touchdown and Rhode island has the lead I think we're going to see a lot of fireworks before this day is over with. This has been a fun game to look at so far. Well, uh, an Im important, important drive right there for Rhode Island because they're going into the win. They, they didn't score a touchdown in the first period. They can only come out of the field goal. Now they get the ball back, boom, and come right, right down the field, establish themselves, saying, we can throw the ball no matter which way we're going today. Tom Earhart, 10 for 20, 157 yards in the afternoon in passing. 13-18, remaining in the first half of play. Andre Guerin on the sideline watching his teammates 
And so far, Scott Perry has done well in his stead in that backfield. URI turns the ball over a couple of times, then finally gets one into the end zone, and now it's a 10-7 ball game. And Paul Stringfellow boots the ball. This is a long kick. Nice. Tim Tevens takes it at the goal line. 10. Cuts to the near sideline. Out to the 18 and will be knocked down at the 18-yard line. That's where UNH will take over. First down and 10 yards to go. There you see Tim Tevens, who was the Yankee Conference Player of the Year last year. Carl Mackey All made set. the stick Get on him off. on the near side. Scoring drive for the Rams, six plays, 75 yards, minute 42 off the clock, 13 pass. 13-yard pass to Damian Riley for the TD. 10 to 7's our score. Burns hands off to Perry. And he moves it out to the 25-yard line. Again, you've got to be impressed with the way Perry has run the football today and the holes that are opening up. Tim Poland and Pat Lawson finally get to it. I was impressed on that one because Rhode Island, just before the snap of the ball, took one of its defensive backs, Mike Cassidy, out of the game and brought in another line, lineman, Bob Peterson, to stick an extra lineman in there to try to stop the running game, and they still uh, reeled off uh, seven yards on a quick trap. Perry, 13 carries, 88 yards. Hand off to Schreiner this time, and the big fullback just bowls his way near that first down. He has the first down at the 33-yard line. Mike Schreiner, the unsung hero in that backfield, and Bob Griffin calls Schreiner the best fullback in the conference. And it's he never carries ball. the ball. Yeah, Shrine is low to the ground. And on a day like today, pick his spot. He just uses his muscle to get up there. He's fighting for everything. He knows where the first down marker is. He's a veteran player. And he lunges forward at the last instant to get the first down. Here's the pitch to Perry near side. And Perry is brought down at the 35-yard line. Pickup of about three on the play before Pat Lawson can pull him down. Lawson loves all-star wrestling. Says he really enjoys seeing people <laughs> being thrown around out there. <laughs> He's the red Is that, is that one of the tougher courses they have here? That's right. That's got to be one of the tough ones. <laughs> Second down, seven yards to go. Ball directly on the 35-yard line. Burn, pitch again to Perry. Familiar scene. Perry gets it out to about the 37 number of defenders over there. Ray Williams is there. Also there, Brad Carson and Mike Cassidy. People watching at home are probably wondering why New Hampshire's running back to its right after having so much success running to its left. left. Okay, the reason is Rhode Island has shifted its defense to the left. They're committing five men along the line of scrimmage, really five and a half with the safety cheating up to that side of the field, to uh, New Hampshire's left and only three over here. So they're trying to run back to the weak side but they haven't been able to do it with success. Bill Farrell is flanked to the left side. Mike Rubbishad is split to the near side, and Byrne wants to throw. And gets it off. Oh, it's almost incomplete. It's almost uh, complete, I should say. Flanagan had his first shot at it. Rubbishad was also over there, and Mike Cassidy tipped it. Good defensive play by Cassidy. And there you see Tom Flanagan, the tight end, going back to the huddle. Byrne 0 for 4 passing. Well. A little play action to try to slow down the pass rush. Now, Rich Byrne rolls to his right. He gets himself pinned in on the sideline. He should never throw this ball. He throws it into traffic, risks an interception. Look at that. Three Rhode Island defenders around. The ball, luckily for him, bounces away and goes incomplete. Tom Flanagan will punt the ball away. He's standing on his own 23. Carbone and Donfield are the two deep men. And a high end over Ender, and it goes out of bounds. The wind, the wind really took that ball. Not putting so much length on it, but really brought it toward us, uh, toward the sideline, Will. It looked like the, the wind has switched since the beginning of the game. Like Instead of going left to right and up and down the field, now it's coming across the field. There you see the official spotting the chains. And Rhode Island has a first down and 10 from the 33-yard line. That was a 30-yard kick. Would have been about 50 if he kept it in bounds. That's right. went 20 more in the air. Rams leading 10 to 7, 10 46 remaining first half. Earhart to the right side. It is complete and out of bounds to Damian Riley at the 45 yard line. 
Stan Harrison defending on the play. Now, Riley had been the decoy for much of the season because they were double and triple teaming him. But the last two weeks, the last three weeks, really, he has really come alive last week with those four touchdown catches. And he had uh, eight catches in all for 159 yards. But you have to say a lot about a fellow who doesn't get the football for most of the season but keeps his attitude in there, and when he's called upon, he makes the play. Earhart drops, first and ten. Being rushed, oh, he's hit. And it is intercepted by Neil Zonfrelli. And Brian O'Neill was in rushing. He wrapped up Earhart, who Earhart is still is down. Hurt. Oh, he is Tom hurt. Earhart still laying down. Watch 62, Brian O'Neill. Boom, a sandwich shot. Gets him from the front, and Paul Boulay gets him from the back, and that's where the collision came. And that's why the interception came about, because he was forced to throw as he was getting hit. He didn't get anything on the ball, and Zonfirelli had the chance to step in front of Foster, I think it was, and make the play, and there's Earhart. See, he's got the flak jacket. Right. Oh, See, boy. they're opening up right now to take a look, because he took one shot. He was getting hit from the back by number 98, Paul Boulay, and then he caught it from the front by number 62, Brian O'Neill. There was no give. There was no place from the go. He was a sandwich. And the backup is Greg Farland, who had to come in in that Delaware game when Tom was injured with that hip pointer. And there you see Earhart being lifted onto his feet. He may have just had the wind knocked out of him. Coach Bob Griffin is out there and obviously hopes that's the case. Nothing more than air being knocked out. Take a look again. Like we said earlier, New Hampshire has gotten better pressure on Earhart than any team we've seen. There's Brule coming in from behind, 98. Watch O'Neill from the front, 62. Now look at the impact together. He's off the ground, up in midair. He has no way to fall, and he takes a heck of a shot, and that's what knocked the wind out of him. On the turnover, the intercepted pass by Zonfrelli. It's first and 10, New Hampshire, but Guy Carbo comes up with the interception the other way. Byrne fires it downfield, and Guy Carbone gets the second interception. He had an interception last week for 109 yards. Well, it's a great call by New Hampshire. First down, he's got him out there. He doesn't throw it out in front of him. If he leads him on the plat, Guy Carbone couldn't step in front and make the catch, but he doesn't. The receiver has to slow down, and as he does slow down to try to catch the ball, Carbone can get himself into the play to make the interception. And the sun comes out. And, and Farland's in the ball game. Greg Farland is in after Earhart had the win knocked out of him, perhaps more damage. Farland, who played in Earhart's absence earlier this season, throws the ball intended for Donfield over his head. Well, Guy Carbone last week against Lafayette ran the ball back 109 yards. Of course, it's only 100 yards in NCAA, uh, the, uh, in the NCAA stats, but it is for 109 in the Yankee Conference book. And there you see Farland going to the sideline, and Earhart is back in the ball game. So one play breather. Farland came in and threw for over 300 yards against Delaware in the first game of the season after Earhart was knocked out in the third play. That hip pointer. Here's the draw play. Haynes. And no fooling the UNH defense this time. Dan Federico is there to make the stop at the 39-yard line. That'll bring up a third down and 11. Along with Bill O'Malley. Well, oh, that UNH defense has been ferocious so far in the ball game. Good, good pass rush. They knew what the job had to be done today, uh, that they have to get in on the passer, and they certainly have done it. Here you see Don Field splitting to the near side and Riley to the far side. Third down, 11. And too much time. Rams take too much with 9.44 remaining in the first half and leading 10 to 7. What is that, our third or fourth delay call in the ball game? The reason for it, I, I think, Ken, is uh, New Hampshire is jumping around a lot before the snap. They're showing all kinds of defenses. So Earhart comes out to look at the line of scrimmage. He sees something he doesn't want to go against. He checks the playoff. They jump around again. And when you have only 25 seconds, you have a problem if you can't adjust very quickly. Fourth penalty, worth 25 yards. UNH, one penalty in that five-yard walk-off because of the delay call. 
third down and 16 now. Sun showering Mead Stadium for the first time this afternoon. Earhart throws it. Forster has it to the 44-yard line. Well, Brian Forster makes his fourth reception of the afternoon in another big URI play, Will. Watch them drop back into the zone, and they get burned in the zone defense. Foster's releasing off the line of scrimmage. Dave Duggan trying to pick him up all day, 58, number 12, Stan Harrison. He gets in between all of them before the hit is made, and he's the kind of guy you don't want to run in front of downfield. First down, 10 yards to go. Ball at the 44-yard line. Earhart drops back, throws to Lipton to the right side. He's hit, gets the ball off, but it's overthrown over Damian Riley's head. And again, coming from the blind side was Ilya Jaruschuk, that outstanding all-conference left end. He has two younger brothers on the team. Basil is his backup, and Alex is a redshirt freshman. <laughs> They're going to call it the Russian Iron Curtain when all three of them are able to, to play. Billy is just a junior, and Basil is a freshman along with Alex. That'll be interesting next year. Earhart wants to throw on second down. Pass is incomplete. Forster, I think, slipped. Yes, he, he was did. double teamed. Yes, he did. Forster went down about eight or nine yards, made his cut to the outside, and when he planted his foot, his left foot in the inside, he came out from underneath him before he could right himself and get his balance. The pass had already gone by. Earhart has just under 10,000 yards in his career. That includes the two years at CW Post after he transferred to URI. He has, in coming into this game, 6,002 yards. He owns 18 of 21 Yankee Conference records as a quarterback. Third down and 10. 8.53 remaining first half. 10-7 Rams lead. Earhart trying to pad that. He launches the bomb and has Riley overthrown. Riley got one hand out, his left hand up, but couldn't pull it in. And it brings up a fourth down. Eric Thompson and Stan Harrison back there. Ted White is also back. Here's Damian Riley, Riley right here. He runs super routes. He really does. He's almost like a professional wide receiver. Takes the coverage, Stan Harrison to the inside, breaks back out to the outside. But what happened to him, and it wasn't his fault, is because of the pass rush, Earhart had to throw it prematurely. And here's a, here's a fake punt and a pass. Donnelly finds... Guy Carbone, who has the first down at the 27-yard line. Well, they had been talking about a fake punt for three weeks and been practicing it, and finally, Donnelly throws the pass to Carbone, and it's good for a first down. Well, that caught everybody off guard, and Carbone, who's got a lot of speed out there, turned it up the field and ran it down the sideline. I'm really surprised that New Hampshire get burned on its own end of the field because even if they punted, you're not going to get a run back. That's right. It's going to be inside the 10 or in the end zone, so you'd think most of your people would still be committed to the line of scrimmage. From the 29, first and 10, URI after the big play. Earhart over the middle, Tony DiMaggio. He's still on his feet, gets away. 25, down to the 19-yard line. Now, this is a tough kid. Eric Thompson finally pulls him down. DiMaggio, who last year broke his arm in the UNH game, has a metal plate and six screws in his arm. This is just a shot control type pass. DiMaggio comes off about five yards, but what he does is really fight. He shows great determination. He keeps on taking the hits. Then Tim Tevens bounces off him. Now he can start upfield, put his head down before Eric Thompson gets a shot at him and, and brings him down, but it is another first down. Earhart 13 for 27. Now he's up over the 200-yard mark at 204. And wants to throw again. Plenty of time, launches the bomb, but double team back there, That's and the flag is down. Forster was everything but handcuffed and wrestled to the ground that time. Elliot Jaruschuk was back there on the play. He had come off his left end spot and was a fifth defensive back. Now, there seems to be two flags here, although I didn't see the second one, but here's Earhart back. Everybody is covered. There's great coverage on this play. He throws to Forster, who's being double teamed in the end zone. Harrison is one, and Jaruschuk is the other. Now, there was a flag there for pass interference, but I think there was a, a penalty back here at the line of scrimmage, so you might get offsetting. Here's the ball coming in the end zone. See the coverage. You can see them taking Forster down. Both of them, Harrison and Jurostek, have a piece of it. I don't think so, Will. I think it's just a pass interference call. Or perhaps uh, the flag on this side was also calling the same thing. It is a 15-yard walk-off here. 
And the ball is spotted at the four-yard line. Did you see a flag on the near side? Well, yes. That when the I didn't see a flag, but the official on the play come over, and he kept pointing like something happened right here. I see. So I think whatever it was, Rhode Island rejected that call. Maybe it was a, a hold at the line of scrimmage and took the pass interference in the 15 yards that puts him down on the four-yard line. Where it is, forced and goal at the four. Earhart shouts him out. Rolling to the right side, has an opening, has Forster, touchdown! Brian Forster there, and the score. And you see a happy Brian Forster running behind the Rams bench on the far sideline, and some high fives. It's something you don't see very often. Earhart rolling out of the pocket and throwing on the run. But as he does, New Hampshire has to commit a few people to him, and they can't have them all on Foster. And there he gets away from even double coverage in the end zone to make the grab for the touchdown. Eight minutes and three seconds remaining in the first half, and URI has taken a 16 to 7 lead. And Mike Griffin will attempt to tag on the extra point. Ball is on the tee. It is up and good. And with 8:03 remaining in the second period of play, the pass to Brian Forster, who now has six catches for 90 yards, makes it 17 to 7. There's Zonfarelli, the linebacker, looking right at Earhart. Now Earhart will roll to the right. You see Zonfarelli going with him. Everybody has to go with him. But he, on the run, without a great deal of pressure, finds Foster, who simply ran down four or five yards. And once he got in the end zone, turned to the outside. And it's a very difficult play for a, a defensive back or anybody to try to cover when you get a simple out and the quarterback delivers the ball on time out in front of the receiver. Earhart, this season now, has 22 touchdown passes. That's in six games, three plays of that first game. Stan Harrison and Tim Tevens are the two deep men, and Paul Stringfellow will get set to kick it off. So the Rams took a 3-0 lead on the 24-yard field goal by Mike Griffin. Three seconds left in the first. Scott Perry with the six-yard run made it 7-3 New Hampshire. Then Earhart, two touchdown passes here in the second quarter. 13 yards to Damian Riley and four yards to Brian Forster. That's where we stand now, 17 to seven. And Stringfellow puts it up in the air. And it is taken by Mike Schreiner at the 14 yard line. Schreiner bowls his way up to the 27. So UNH with eight minutes on the clock. And now, well, finding themselves down 17 to seven, and they must think offense now and think of putting some points on here before the end of the first half. The scoring drive, nine plays. 60 yards, two minutes and 26 seconds off the clock. 228, I should say, four yard pass to Forster, provided a touchdown. Rich Byrne, who is 0 for 4 so far in the ball game in passing, 0 for 5. May have to start throwing him, but here Perry is tripped up right at the line of scrimmage. And now we get a little rain coming down again on the midfield, and the wind picks up. Pat Lawson makes the play. I think Perry. Pat Lawson did because that was going to be a long distance play if he did because the blocker out in front of him, Schreiner, ran right through, and the only thing there was the safety man. And if Lawson doesn't stick his hand out, that's a big gainer. Lawson, who was moved from strong safety on this defense to linebacker. An outstanding one this season for the Rams. Second down, eight yards to go. 7.24 remaining in the first half. Perry tripped up behind the line of scrimmage again. And another good defensive play by Bill Maker. Maker, the J.C. transfer who has had chronic back problems in his career at URI, moved from offensive guard, is the backup right end, 231-pound senior. Robichaud is back into the ball game, and now he splits wide to the far side. Bill Farrell on the near side as Byrne wants to throw. Looking for his first reception, and no flag. There is a flag on the far side. Thought it was I don't, pretty obvious that time. No, I don't think? agree with no? that at all. I hope we see it in the replay. The ball was going to be thrown behind him, and I don't think there's any way he could have caught this ball, and that's why I don't think it should be pass interference. Byrne is straight back. Robichaud, as we mentioned before the call, Ken did, was flanked to the left. Now he's coming across the field. Watch the ball behind him. See it? How can he catch that ball? I don't think he could have caught the ball. And if he can't catch the ball, it's not supposed to be pass interference. You're right. Obviously behind him. And here's the call from the referee. A first down on the pass interference. And they'll walk it off. 
from the 30-yard line. 6.45 remaining in the first period. And the wind is kicking up here a little bit. And secondly, and secondly, I don't think there was any contact before he started the slide. And when he started the slide and loses footing, trying to control, to keep himself under the control to come back and make the catch, that's what initiated the contact. I don't that's think there would have been contact if he didn't start to get down and try to stop himself. That's open season when you're off your feet like that. That's an interesting call. 17-7, Rams lead it. New life into that UNH offense now with a pass interference call. Burns still has not completed a pass. First down and 10 at the 42. Pitch to Perry. And Perry is hit at the 43-yard line. Maybe gets a yard on the play, and that's it. Pat Lawson was there defending on the play. Ball at the 43. Second down and nine yards to go. 6.24 remaining in the first half. There you go. Look, good look at Scott Perry. Two new wide it. receivers in this play, Tim. They just exchanged them. It's a slot to the left side. And Byrne wants to throw. Downfield, it is almost intercepted incomplete. Mike Cassidy was back there. And the ball went through his hands. Well, Byrne knows he has to put the ball up in the air, but he hasn't had much success. You see Tom Flanagan, number 81, who was the tight end there. He was over in that area. Yeah, Rich has to calm down a little bit. He really does. He's been wild high throwing the ball today. That time, it was he had the option to run, uh, run on throw because two lines were pulled out with him. I think he could have run it up the field and certainly made some yardage. He's been thrown into coverage all day. He's got to settle down a little bit. It is a big game, but at this point in the game, he should have gotten his feet on the ground. Curtis Olds is blitz. now in as a split left for the blitz. They nullify all of that. And Byrne is thrown down behind the line by Mark White. White comes up with the big play. The rush was on by that defensive front. Brad Carson was also putting on pressure. Take a look at this. Well, the blitz is coming, and Byrne obviously doesn't see it. Because here, here comes Pat Lawson behind him. Gets away from the block. There's all kinds of... Watch him try to throw it now. He knows he, he wants to throw it. Most guys would say, hey, forget it. I'm going down. I'm not going to throw the ball in traffic. And then he had to finally take the big loss. Tim Poland was also in there. And now Tom Flanagan will try to boot the ball away at the 15. Oh, a high kick. Guy Carbone and Donfield just watch it drop. It gets a good UNH bounce. And down to the 24-yard line. That's where the Rams will take over with 5.13 remaining in the first half and leading 17-7. 12,000 fans on hand here standing around the field watching this big Yankee Conference showdown. A 48-yard punt. Good roll. New Hampshire has to make a stand here. If they don't make a stand here, if they let Rhode Island go up the field and score this time, it's all over because I don't think their offense can come back and score that kind of points in the second half of the ball game. They have to stop it right here, keep the score where it is, and hope that its offense can get together in the second half. Hand off out of the backfield. Brian Morris, the single setback, and he moves forward for a couple of yards. Neil Zonfrelli is there to make the stop. Coming into the game, UNH with the top-rated pass defense in the country, first in total defense and fifth in scoring defense. You are right. Obviously, with a great passing game, 13th in total offense and 13th in scoring in the country. Seven possible All-Americans on these two teams. Garrett, of course, on the sideline today. Tommy Earhart, one of the All-American candidates, lines him up, second-team All-American last year. And he throws. Tony DiMaggio has the catch at the 34-yard line. Scott Curtis makes the play. Brian Forster, Damian Riley, the other two All-Americans, and Saranovitz, Sikoni, and Zonfrelli, the All-American candidates for UNH. We're seeing some good ones here today. There's a good shot of Tony DiMaggio, the tight end. 6'4", 216-pound senior. Came into the game with 105 catches in his career, 1,247 yards and nine touchdowns. Four minutes remaining in the first half. 17-7, Earhart to throw to the right side, looking for Riley, who makes the catch and can't quite get outside, and a penalty marker is down and maybe a face mask call. Stan Harrison was defending on the play, 
and Stan may have just gotten the face mask as he pulled him to the turf. This is a timing, Pat, and third and short. Air Huck is back. Look at Damian Riley all the way. Throws on the break. There's no way Harrison can come up and make the coverage. He has to respect him deep. Watch Harrison wrap his hand. See uh -oh. his left arm right around. Pull him down by the face mask. The question is, is that five or is it 15? That's, that's a good point. Five if it was unintentional and 15 if it was a grasp. It's a five. Un, it's an unintentional grasp. <laughs> it's an unintentional grasp, right. I'm he sorry I didn't mean to do it, but there it was. <laughs> he certainly did. <laughs> that's a tough thing to call, isn't it? Gets the referee off the hook, though, if you don't want to call it 15. First down and 10. Ball at the 47. Earhart to throw. Looking for DiMaggio and over his head. Firing into his own. Riley was further on down the sideline. Ilya Jaruschuk was defending on the play. If you will notice, that was one of the few times so far in this game that there hasn't been some type of pressure on Earhart, either True. a lot or even mediocre. There was none. So you have to wonder if the New Hampshire defense, being on the field so long in the first half, is starting to tire out a little bit. You know, they have been pass rushing a lot. They have been on the field because their offense hasn't done anything. That's right. Second down and 10. Earhart to throw again. A lot of time. You call it, Will. Look at this. Plenty of time. Over the middle. Pass is almost caught by Davey Riley. Had two chances at it. Look at these statistics, Will. Neil oh, Zanfarelli's uh -oh. down over there holding his left ankle, and that would be a tough loss oh, boy. for the University of New Hampshire to lose one of their best defensive players, a great linebacker. Let's hope it's nothing serious over there. The trainer rushing out. I think, I think he's all right. It looked like he was holding either the top of his foot, sometimes you, you stretch your arch a little bit, or his left ankle. Let's take a look and see if we can pick up exactly what it was here. Air hot's back. Count the time. You can start counting to yourself at home. Look at him stand there. Stand there. Two receivers. Foster and Riley were on the right sideline. Now Riley readjusts. He's going to take his route back into the middle of the field. The pass is a little up there. It's tipped by Stan Harrison. Damian Riley gets hit from behind. He always catches the ball on the rebound. Look at these stats, Will. URI 224 yards through the air. UNH nothing. Yards rushing, UNH 119, URI 19. Talk about contrast in styles. Zon Frelli now comes to the sideline and will sit on the bench and they'll examine him over there. He's a good one. He's trying to walk it off. Third down, 10, URI at the 47-yard line. Earhart looking for Riley, who stumbled. Riley slipped just a moment on that sideline about five yards from the ball, and that held him up. Well, what happened was this. Riley was going to go straight up the sideline, and Stan Harrison made a heck of a move. He knocked him out of bounds. And once you're out of bounds, you can't come in bounds to catch the ball. So the play was dead right there. But he did a nice job, a legal play, had him close to the sideline, just knocked him out before the ball was thrown, and that eliminated the play. Jim Donnelly will punt the football away. Donnelly on the afternoon, one punt for 45 yards. Eric Thompson is the deep man standing at the 18-yard line. 3.25 remaining first half. URI punting the way and leading 17-7. to High end over Ender. And was that a fair catch sick call or not? And he was pulled down at the 8-yard line. I think he called for a fair catch. His hand went up just briefly. Let's see if, uh, I don't know if we can get a replay on this, but I, I think you'll see, Will, his hand went up for just a second. His hand does go up, but I don't know if they're going to call it an illegal fair catch signal or not. There's the punt. It's high in the air. It gets caught up in the wind a little. Eric Thompson, 39, doesn't know whether to catch it or not. He says, nope, I'll let it bounce. Now, something you never want to do with two guys staring you right in the face, come back and try to catch it again. There was no reason for it. Well, let's see. They're setting the chains up and... The officials are examining the situation. There's a look at the sideline. Well, it was your call, Ken. It was, it was the illegal. They're going to call an illegal fair catch signal. That was either, hi, how you doing real fast, or that was an illegal. Uh, he, he never should have picked it up after that, as you mentioned. Rich Byrne in the huddle there. Well, see, that's it. If, if he just gave the signal and let it go, that's all right. But if you give the signal and then you go catch it, it's There's a, a problem. Okay. <laughs> no, lots of times in that end of the close to your own goal line, a guy will get the signal, let the ball bounce into the end. Right. Zone. Hold up the defense. That's right. But there, he made the mistake of going after it again. 
So it's a first and 15, ball at the five. Handoff Perry, tries the left side and moves it to the nine yard line. Guy Carbone is defending on the play. Three minutes, seven seconds remaining in the half and a lot of territory between UNH and the goal line. Some 90 yards away. Needing points, 17 to seven is the score. Been an exciting first half. Burns sets them up again. Can't handle the snap. Finally finds the handle, but will be brought down by Ray Williams at the eight yard line. Well, that's uh, enough to scare you to death. <laughs> this this is a little juggling act pops here. Pops right out of there. He tries to keep control of it, gets it on his fingertips. Many times a quarterback will just take it down a dive in the middle line, but this is a pretty good athlete, Rich Byrne. He tries to get outside, but Ray Williams is there, so he said, ah, I may as well get down right here. And now New Hampshire again is in third and long, and they haven't done anything in third and long all afternoon. And a timeout is called as Rich Byrne comes over to the sideline. You can kind of see how the Rams have taken the game away from UNH, keeping them pinned up deep in their own territory and, and causing a little nervousness maybe down there. Well, from the very beginning of the game when they, they thought they were going to, uh, I guess, intimidate New Hampshire a little bit by throwing 11 men on the line of scrimmage for the first play, and then Perry uh, bops out of there and runs 40 yards. But from the beginning, they have demonstrated uh, New Han Rhode Island here that it wants to put the pressure on Rich Byrne. They're lining everybody up and close to the line of scrimmage, nine out of their 11 men. They have one man playing the wide receiver, man to man, generally Ray Williams, and they have one safety man sitting back there. The other nine guys are committed to the line of scrimmage saying, we're gonna stop your run, try to throw it. And so far, Rich Byrne hasn't been able to complete a pass. Bill Bowes looks a little worried on the sideline there. You would be too. I certainly, I certainly would be. Third down, 11. Two and a half minutes remaining in the half. Burn hand off to Perry on the draw play. 14 yard line. And that brings up a fourth down. Pat Lawson and Guy Carbone are defending. And now the Rams want to time out. Try to conserve the final two minutes and 16 seconds on the clock and see if they can put more points on the board. Already leading 17 to 7. College football 85 continues on Nesson this week. First with USC hosting Washington State. That game will be seen Sunday night, 1130, and again on Monday and Tuesday evenings. Then the Southwest Conference action comes your way Tuesday at 7 as the SMU Mustangs take on the Aggies of Texas A&M. Be sure to tune in for your favorite college football action right here on Nesson, where we deliver. You're all into that Southwest Conference stuff, aren't you, Will? Oh, I'm excited about it. <laughs> Patriots tomorrow, big game against Miami. What do you think? Well, you know, this is the best shot the Patriots uh, have had at them uh, up here in years, although they have beaten them a few times. But defensively, the Patriots are much better. If they get a day like this where the wi uh, wind and the weather could be a factor with Dan Marino, it really helped the Patriots out. I think the Patriots are going to win the ball game. All right, you heard it here first. Might be last. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Guy Carbo takes it to the 48-yard line. Has running room. And inside the 30 to the 20. Tries to fight off Tim Tevens and is pulled out at the eight-yard line. Well, Flanagan's punt came down at the 48. Carbone will not be denied. That's he is all worked up as he heads off the field. Well, Flanagan's punt comes down too fast. His coverage does not have time to get downfield. Watch how much room Carbone has when he gets the ball. Look, watch him pick the crack. He turns it up the middle, takes it all the way back across the field. He catches all the New Hampshire people in the middle of the field and goes 43 yards before Tim Stevens can take him out of bounds at the eight-yard line. Disaster spelled all over that one for the Wildcats. 2-0-1 remaining in the first half. Rams knocking on the door again. Earhart to throw over the middle. Forster, touchdown. Brian Forster barely turned around in time to get the football. Tom DeGasparis fell down on the play right at the goal line, and Forster turns around and bang. The ball's right there. Yeah, hat back, only needs eight yards. Looks for Forster coming across the middle. Tom DeGasparis, watch him on the ground. He's falling down. There he is, number six, leaving Forster wide open. That's twice today. DeGasparis has fallen down in the coverage. Maybe. <laughs> 
Boston likes to run into people and knock them off, but I don't think he did that time. This contact before the play. And Mike Griffin gets hammered as he approaches the ball. The referee helps him up. Those are the kind of shots you don't like to see since Griffin is already working with a reconstructed knee. He was, his football career was history when and he his, was injured in spring practice. And his father, the coach, doesn't like it either. He's all the way down to the 25-yard line well, wanting to know what the story is. There he is. There's Bob saying, what's going on out there? He says, come here, Mr. Official. Let's talk that one over. How come my kid, the kid, gets decked? Nothing's done. Well, we saw him decked in the UMass game, and nothing was called, and no piece of the ball, and that should have been a, a penalty. Now Griff wants to talk with the head referee. It's an interesting case, and we talked about this in one of the other games here on Ness and Will, that your son had the same type of reconstructive surgery that Mike Griffin did, and it is really a devastating thing when you have something like that. Now, his, his uh, cruciate was actually severed, and they had to take another ligament and string it across his knee. It's rebuilt. Well, it's a terrible injury. I was talking to Andy Moradi and the athletic director of the University of New Hampshire about a half hour before kickoff, and he was talking about Dan Orr, who's the backup running back, tailback behind Andre Garin. Scott Perry, who we've seen play the whole first half here, number 27, is actually number three tailback for New Hampshire. Or the backup guy has to go for reconstructive surgery because of a knee injury, and they're concerned that that might be a career ender for him that he might never play again. So when you get the severe knee injury like that, you have to get a little bit of luck to come back and a lot of hard work and rehabilitation, and obviously Mike Griffin has done it. As we're waiting for the discussion to end, take a look at the touchdown again. Yeah. You're the safety man now. Earhart is back. Quick look. Read inside. Sees Air, uh, Brian Foster, 86, coming across inside. Degas Barris, like we mentioned, had fall, fallen down, and there was nobody there to cover him. Well, the big play by Carbone, moving the ball 43 yards on the punt return, sets up the quick touchdown. And suddenly, UNH is looking at a 23-7 deficit, and the nightmares are starting to appear. Everything has gone wrong here for the Wildcats in the second quarter. Well, the two Three. biggest plays of the first half have been made by Carbone. That's right. You know, the, uh, it, was a, it was a close uh, ball game. It's the two Griffins getting together. <laughs> Well, they might bring the team out and say, okay, you guys want to fool around? Now we're going to go for two. And I think that's what's happening. That's they took exactly the field to get close to the goal line and say, okay, we'll go for the two. Earhart, who's 17 for 34, 232 yards in the ball game, tries to tag on the two-point conversion. 23 to 7 is the score. Earhart drops, fires, incomplete. Intended for Damian Riley. Stan Harrison is defending on the play over there. So a minute 59 remaining in the half. The score, 23 to 7. Here's the timing pattern. Uh, Rhode Island runs so well. Damian Riley just goes right to the outside. Watch the recovery by Stan Harrison here. Just gets there in time to punch the ball out of his hand. If he had made a clean catch, Riley might have had it, but he bobbled a little, little bit and gave the opening to Harrison just to slap the ball away from him. This is part of the physical education program here. They do as many push-ups as there are points on the board. They must be in great shape with this team by the end of the year. I noticed they quit at three. That's right. <laughs> we, we got to them late. <laughs> Minute 59 remaining in the first oh, half of play. Second quarter was all URI. The scoring drive, one play after the long carbone return. Eight yards, two seconds consumed on it and the eight-yard pass to Forster, good for the touchdown. Well, that's three touchdown passes, Will, so far for Griffin, or for uh, Earhart this afternoon. He had five last week in the win over Lafayette. That was the third time in his career he had thrown five in one ball game. Well, today's game's an illustration why he throws so many, because even inside the five, they don't run for it. They're on the one, two, three, <laughs> wherever they are, they throw for it, so whatever they score, fake reverse. Tim Tevens to the 25 and loses the ball momentarily, but pulls it back in in a hurry. Well, the clock has stopped with a minute 52 left in the first half, and it's been a URI first half, 23 to 7, and I wonder what Bill Bowles will be talking about at halftime. What Bill Bowles is going to be talking about is about his offense and the ability to make a big play. They have to get back in the ball game in the second half right here. Rich Byrne, 19, is going to have to make some big plays. 
and Byrne drops back, takes the draw. Over the middle, pass is complete at the 39-yard line. Nice catch by Robichaud. Mike Robichaud, that is the first pass completion of the afternoon by UNH. Clock continues to run with a minute 43 remaining in the half. Schreiner and Perry in that backfield, and Byrne wants to throw. Pass is caught by the tight end, Tom Flanagan, at the 50-yard line. Flanagan is pulled down by Carbone at the 50. Well, that's his second pass completion, two in a row there, and that's the kind of play they're going to need to get back in this ballgame. That's the kind of confidence he's going to have to take in at the half with him. I think if he went in at the half and hadn't had one completion, he'd really come out doubting himself. Now at, low, at least he knows he can do it. Watch this now. Here's what happens to a, uh, a team that goes out of the eye when they, you know, everything's going to be a play fake before he throws, and everybody in the ballpark knows he's going to throw, so you're just wasting your time. <laughs> Watch. Boom, there's the fake. Right. What's the fake for? They know you're going to throw anyhow. And there's the throw yeah. out that, of bounds. And that's what happens to an eye formation team, you know, because they, they're so used to everything's built off the run that they got to fake the run before they're going to throw. I always say to myself, hey, why don't they just put something in the attack where we're going to go back and throw it? There's going to be times where you just have to go back and throw it, and this is one of those times. You're right. Everybody knows it's coming at you. You might as well So you're just wasting up your time, it. and your quarterback's running back with his back to the line of scrimmage he's not looking in his receivers to see what's happening before he turns around a minute two remaining in the first half wind is really kicking up now here's the pass complete to tom flanagan and flanagan is pulled down by carbone at the 44 yard line let's see if they give him forward momentum and timeout is called by unh with 49 seconds remaining and that will bring up a third down at about two What New Hampshire has to hope for here is any kind of a score. Even a field goal would help them. You know, this way they would need, because in like this at the half, they need three scores to get back in the ball game. If they get one here, they'd only need two scores to get back in the ball game in the second half. Well, along with Thursday, or along with tonight's Bruins game, I should say, with Chicago, we ask you to join us on Thursday night for our continuing coverage of the Bruins, facing off against the Hartford Whalers live at 7.30 from the Garden. Coverage begins uh, with Bruins Digest at 7 o'clock, and then the hockey, live and exclusive, right here on Nesson, where we deliver. Ken Bell with Will McDonough from a windy Mead Stadium. Bill Bowes giving some instructions to Rich Byrne, who returns to the lineup now. Byrne, the six-foot junior. And you see Griffin on the far sideline talking with Bob White, who's number 72. down three ball at the 42 blitz. and the blitz and burn is getting rid of the ball at the last minute the official has his hand on the flag but won't throw it and he will not throw it <laughs> that was an interesting <laughs> thing wasn't it oh the referee tony chambers he was caught in the middle he wanted to, he went for the flag and he <laughs> said wait a second there's a receiver in the area he was trying to throw it to a receiver new hampshire with this situation clock running out they're going to go for it anyhow let's throw the ball upfield Pat Lawson on the nice defensive play. Fourth down and three. And blitz Byrne again. wants to throw. Here comes the blitz again. Now the pass to the right side. Almost picked off by Ray Williams. Nice drive. Nice drive. Well, URI has 39 seconds in which to try to move down the field. And uh, what, a, what a hand from the crowd on the far sideline. The home crowd cheering the defense. Rams 23, Wildcats 7. Will and I are doing a little moving around up here now. It's getting a little brisk. That wind is picked up. Get him! There you see Bob Donfield split to the near side, number 48. Earhart to throw. Screen. Right side, Doug Haynes. 40, 45, 50, 45, 40, 38. Doug Haynes with a big gainer. 29 seconds remaining. And the Rams line up immediately. The official sets the ball. And bang, the clock starts again. 
Earhart to throw. Right side to Riley. Makes the catch. He bobbled it. Or is it? Yes, it is a catch. Because he had the one foot in bounds. Well, he knocked the ball up in the air. I thought maybe he was out of had juggled it. <laughs> this is a very unusual play. You don't see this happen very often. I don't think Damian Ryland even thought he was going to get the ball because the defender was right there with him. Earhart had thrown it on the break. It was a simple sideline pass. And the ball came on Riley so quick he was stunned. He got his hands up in front of his face. It popped up in the air. He caught it, and then he stepped out of bounds. <laughs> got two things accomplished. Stopped the clock and gave you a reception in the game. Second down and four. 22 seconds left. Earhart, plenty of time. Over the middle. DiMaggio, five to the two. Tony DiMaggio, it looked like he was in slow motion going down the field, waiting for the ball to arrive. And with 16 seconds left, DiMaggio beats Eric Thompson and Wayne Larson for the reception. Earhart back to throw. I think DiMaggio loses his balance before he catches the ball. You see uh -huh. him all stumbling. See That's him? it. He's off balance. He can't regain his composure. Stevens and Thompson make the stop at the one-yard line. And now Rhode Island has a chance to blow the ball game wide open right here. 14 seconds left. Ball at the one. First and goal. Earhart calls the signals. Let's see if they'll pass for this one. No. Handoff. And no running room at all by Haynes. And a penalty marker is down. And a holding call may have been issued on the Rams. Well, maybe this is why they don't <laughs> run down here very often. Great play by New Hampshire. They come in and they stuff the line of scrimmage. Paul Boulay takes it back, but the flag came flying out of there immediately. Almost as soon as Doug Haynes got the handoff, he was hit by Boulay, but almost as soon as that, the flag came flying out of there. Well, a personal foul has been called. I believe it's a personal foul, Will, on UNH. Well, generally, when that happens, what it means is as soon as the ball was snapped, somebody threw a haymaker and said, this will give you something to remember for the second half. Second down, and now the clock is stopped again, and we'll see if this confusion will end here. I don't know if the half end, the clock should have been stopped. I think maybe the clock ran down. Should have been stopped, but the Rhode Island, Rhode Island was the one who had the responsibility of stopping the clock. They and the, the half ends. The half ends with the Rams on the one yard line. And the official is explaining things and he says, come on guys, let's get out of here. Well, an interesting way to end the first half. Rams had a chance to make it a 30 to seven ball game, but leave with a 23 to seven lead. And we're at halftime. We'll see what happens. This is where it all begins, the diagram in the team's playbook. But here's where it really comes together, in packed stadium on Sunday afternoon, the game on the line. That, my friend, is the real thing. And when it comes to sports coverage, the real thing for me is right here, the sporting news. Call this toll-free number to get in on a special half-price offer. The sporting news delivered straight to your mailbox every week at a hefty saving. The sporting news delivers hard-hitting, close-up action. And stats you just won't find in your local news or anywhere else. On-the-scene coverage of pro and college football, basketball, baseball, hockey, boxing, and more. 52 weeks a year. Call toll-free 1-800-255-4321. Save one half off the regular subscription rate. You pay in three easy installments of only $4.96 each. Call now 1-800-255-4321. That's 1-800-255-4321. Rise and shine, cast your line, catch the limit here. Now you're talking fishing, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times, and Stroh's is spoken here. Stroh's, fire brewed for smooth, consistent taste. Now you're talking Stroh's, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times, and Stroh's is spoken here. Do you ever
ever dream of being a Major League Baseball player? Well, you can stop dreaming. If you're over 30 and in good health, you can be a Major Leaguer for a week. The Sox Exchange gives you the opportunity to play ball and socialize with your favorite Red Sox heroes this winter in sunny Winter Haven, Florida. Join Jim Lonborg, George Scott, Louis Tion, and many more stars from the 67 and 75 Red Sox pennant winning teams. Space is limited, so write or call the Red Sox Exchange in Montpelier, Vermont today. Make your dreams a reality. Ken Bell, along with Will McDonough, we are live from Mead Stadium in Kingston, Rhode Island. The halftime score 23 to 7. The URI Rams are running it up on UNH. A weird play to end the first half with the Rams winding up at the one-yard line. As time ran out, they were not watching the clock, and as the clock started with two seconds left, that was it. And that leaves us at our halftime score of 23 to 7. We're going to take a look now at uh, some hockey action and catch up on what happened a couple of days ago right here on this. Thanks, Ken. Hope you're enjoying the football game. Last Thursday night, Boston Garden Bruins back from a long road trip, and they took on the Los Angeles Kings, and the Bruins didn't get on track early, but Pete Peters did, Dave. Well, second straight uh, game, Fred, that the Bruins came out of the shoots rather slowly. The Kings forced the issue, and thank goodness for Pete Peters. Pete made countless saves throughout the game, especially in the first two periods when the game was still on the line, and for that reason, Peters, despite giving up uh, four goals on the night, was the story of the hockey game. Well, we'll look at... Uh, some early saves, uh, Nichols uh, and uh, Marcel Dion very quickly. Well, Bernie Nichols has a great shot from the point. He has a great shot from anywhere, but he's very effective from the point. He gets off a good shot here on Peters, and Pete makes a good save. It really doesn't appear that he's in position for Brian McClellan, who grabs the rebound. McClellan wastes no time, fires, but look at Pete scrambling back in the middle of the net. He made the stop. It was just a matter of trying to get to the best spot possible to to come up with a percentage save, and that's exactly what he did. Bruins got the uh, first score by uh, Craig Neenhouse, but just prior to that, a big save by Peters on uh, Taylor, and then uh, Dolego set up Neenhouse. Well, Craig Neenhouse is quickly showing that he's as much an offensive threat as he is a forechecking threat. He came out of RPI with checking and defensive credentials, but after the wrist shot that uh, really had Chico Resch backing up on his heels Tuesday night, Watch this blistering slap shot that goes right between the wickets of Darren Elliott. Neenhouse with his fifth goal of the season. Not bad for a kid that isn't an offensive hockey player, or so people say. So at one to one, it was Pete Peters keeping the Bruins in the game. An unbelievable save on Dave Taylor, one of many that he made throughout the game. Well, Dave Taylor, along with Marcel Dion and Charlie Simmer, made up the great triple crown line out in L.A. Taylor is trying to carry on the tradition. The shot by Dion, and watch Taylor. He's got the open net, but watch Peters just leap into the middle of the cage, and he catches the puck. Absolutely unbelievable. Taylor cannot figure it out. He said, hey, look, that had to have been in the back of the net. It's not possible for a guy to be able to get back and stop the puck, but that's exactly what Peters did, and that gave the Bruins a little boost. Well, it sure did. It was still one-to-one, -one, and then Charlie Simmer, his 12th goal of the season, coming in on the right-wing side, set up by Peterson. Well, Charlie doesn't miss too many good opportunities, and he had just missed a great chance where he had been set up. And he got a second chance to reprieve, and he made no doubt about it. He took a pass from the left-wing boards, and picked Darren Elliott clean on the short side. What he did was he waited for Elliott to make his move, as he did with Chico Resch the other night, and uh, that's something that only the great goal scorers are capable of doing, holding on to the puck until the last instance. Kluzak across for Peterson. Now watch Peterson right here. He'll hit Simmer, and Charlie will wait. Elliott goes down, so Simmer says time now to shoot, and he does upstairs. That made it 2-1. Uh, to one. Keith Crowder made it 3-1. to one. Appears as though the Bruins were uh, in control. Later on, it was the rookie Dave Pazine, his uh, first goal for the Boston Bruins this season. He, of course, a top junior hockey player and a goal scorer. They hate to send him back to junior hockey, and uh, maybe this will really get him going as Dave Pazine scored his first to help the Boston Cubs. Well, Pacine hasn't gotten a lot of ice time. He played a, waited a few games before he played his first game, and he 
he gets short shifts and, and a lot of time in between shifts. So we really haven't been able to see what he can do when he gets an opportunity. And he's been closely checked when he has had the puck, something he hasn't seen much of. But this is a goal scorer's move here as Bassine will take the puck from behind the net. And as he walks out, Elliott is going to try to check him. And as soon as that stick comes off the ice, Bassine lets go with the backhand right between the pads. Goal number one in the NHL for Dave Bassine, and hopefully the first of many more to come in a Bruins uniform. Well, it helped the Boston cause. Turned out they needed some goals as, uh, in all, Los Angeles got uh, four against uh, Pete Peters. But Peters, certainly the number one star and a real standout. And, of course, the Bruins will take on Chicago Blackhawks at the Boston Garden tonight. Hope to continue their winning ways. It will be Doug Keens in goal. Final score of the game on Thursday night against Los Angeles. Boston winning it by a score of 7-4. to four. Now back to Meade Stadium and more halftime activities. Introducing the all-new Toyota Workforce, the who's who in trucks. A one-ton with more payload than any small truck. A cargo van that's like having a warehouse on wheels. A standard bed with all the features you need still for only $59.98. And with over 95% of all Toyota trucks ever sold still working, you know the force will be with you for a long time. Refreshing, less filling. Now you're talking souls. Now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times. And souls is spoken here. Call this toll free number to get in on a special half price offer. The sporting news delivered straight to your mailbox every week at a hefty saving. You'll get the latest lowdown and the hottest showdown. The facts, the quotes, the trends, the drafts all through the NFL season, on to the playoffs and the Super Bowl. Call toll free 1-800-255-4321. You pay in three easy installments of only $4.96 each. Call now 1-800-255-4321. That's 1-800-255-4321. Besson, your New England sports network, brings you exciting sports programming with the Boston Bruins. Exclusive coverage from the Boston Garden through the Stanley Cup playoffs. The best in New England college sports with New England college football, plus the Southwest, Pac-10, and Big 8. Nesson delivers New England college basketball, fast and furious hockey East action, as well as the exciting 1986 Bean Pot. Nesson also brings you WWF wrestling from the garden, boxing, tennis, and much more. Call your local cable operator today and order Nesson. We deliver. And thank you very much, Dave and Fred, and we'll look forward to hearing from you tonight as the Bruins take on the Chicago Blackhawks. 23-7 to 7 is the score here at halftime. URI is leading UNH, and again, the first half ending at the one-yard line. Time running out on the Rams could have knocked it over for another six points. But it is 23-7. to 7. Teams regrouping here at half, and of course, the Kingston campus, a nice place for 12,000-some-odd students to enjoy their college career work and let's take a look a little closer look at the University of Rhode Island knowledge for its own sake for practical results at the University of Rhode Island that's what research is all about And right at the heart of the campus, you see here, Meade Stadium. And the fans are dancing in the aisles. As a matter of fact, on top of their seats, trying to stay warm here as the wind has kicked up and certainly going to cause some havoc here in the second half. 
it's been a kind of a miserable afternoon uh, for the fan standpoint, but on the field, been nothing but great football played. URI leading 23 to seven. Now, Durham, New Hampshire is quite some place, and of course, we were there for one ball game against Dartmouth earlier this season on Nesson's College Football Game of the Week. We saw what a beautiful place Durham is, and what a fantastic uh, program they have for students to go to Durham. And of course, one of the premier colleges in New England, as far as athletics are concerned. So we have a look at what's going on in Durham, athletically and academically. Of course, Bill Bowes has put together a tremendous tradition athletically, and certainly has done uh, the job with his football team in his 14 years there. Let's take a look at what goes on behind the scenes off the athletic field on the campus of Durham. You just you can't go anywhere, and you just have to take the risk and trust the person below you to catch you if you go for it and you miss it. The challenge of a university education is to reach beyond your grasp. From the 188-acre main campus of the University of New Hampshire in Durham, students and faculty reach to the nearby ocean, the White Mountains to the north, Boston to the south, and well beyond that in intercollegiate athletics, extracurricular activities, and in research projects that take them across the country, around the world, and deep into the oceans and space. For many students, that reaching begins with a program called the Fireside Experience. A five-day version for new freshmen begins with trust games, exercises that help them get ready for an afternoon of rock climbing. And the rock climbing will prepare them for even more, according to Michael Gass, who heads the program. If it's sports you want, now the Boston Herald wraps your weekend with more sports coverage than ever before. Every Friday, the Boston Herald brings you the college and pro picks, previews of all the weekend action, plus a guide to what to do and what to watch. Then the Herald's new Sports Monday section recaps the weekend with in-depth analyses and profiles of high school, college, and professional games. If it's sports you want, read the Herald every day and wrap your weekend with Boston's biggest and best sports sections, only in the Boston Herald. Ford dealers present 8.8 plus. 8.8 annual percentage rate financing on 86 and 85 Tempo and Escort, both when equipped with manual transmissions, plus tough new 86 Rangers and sporty 86 Bronco 2s, plus a special lease offer on all 86 and 85 Ford cars and light trucks. 1986 is off to a great start with 8.8 plus.
Greetings, Paul Guggenheimer back at our Nesson Studios here in Boston, reminding you that tonight, from the Boston Garden at 7 p.m., it'll be exciting Boston Bruins action as the Bruins take on the Chicago Blackhawks. Fred Cusick and Dave Shea will have all of the exciting play-by-play -play for you. I'll be here between the first and second periods with scores and highlights. And don't forget, at 6.30 tonight, Bruins Digest, including highlights of former RPI goalie Darren Pupa's spectacular NHL debut last night as he shut out the defending Stanley Cup champion, Edmonton Oilers. Right now, though, let's go back to Ken Bell and Will McDonough in Kingston, Rhode Island. Thank you, Paul. We're back here at Mead Stadium Live. Ken Bell with Will McDonough. Well, let's run down the first half highlights and started with a 3-0 score with Griffin's 24-yard field goal, 4.30 remaining in the first period. Then, with three seconds remaining in the first quarter, UNH jumped out on that six-yard run by Perry. Well, this was set up by the turnover, you know, and uh, their defense have been playing very, very well from New Hampshire at this point. His Perry cuts it up inside. All of the drive, or all the big plays in this drive, let me say, were made by New Hampshire running to its left, and there's the one that puts it in the end zone to go ahead 7-3. The second quarter, well, that was night and day difference. Earhart went to work. Here he is dropping back, looking over the middle, turns around. Here he comes. Look at the time. He had great protection most of the first half. He unloads the ball. Damian Riley. Damian right Riley there. takes it coming across the middle. He ran a post patent through a zone that time. You know, Riley doesn't run too much in the middle of the field. He, normally you look from on the outside, and when he came inside, he really surprised the New Hampshire secondary. Here's Earhart again coming back to throw. This time he rolls out, which Earhart doesn't do very often. He straightens up, no pressure at all. Watch Foster in your screen. Earhart throws it on strike, throws it out in front of Foster. He can bring it to his body. Even with double coverage, New Hampshire can't make the play. And Forster gets his 21st career touchdown on this play. Yeah, well, a uh, tough break for New Hampshire here because Degas Barrow falls down on the play. Number six, you'll see him trying to get up off the ground. There he is right there. He's gone down too late. Brian Foster's over the middle to make the catch, and that's the final touchdown of the first half for Rhode Island. Rhode Island 23, New Hampshire 7. We'll be back with a second half kickoff from Mead Stadium, Kingston, Rhode Island, in just a moment. Everybody wants a trouble-free car, but these trouble spots can affect your vehicle and the cost to maintain it. Toyota owners tell a different story. Every year, the leading consumer magazine compares vehicle repairs from almost half a million owners. Once again, owners of Toyota, cars, trucks, and vans reported the fewest repairs, making them the most trouble-free. Better than Nissan, Honda, Chevy. Get more trouble-free driving at your Toyota dealer now. Who can ask for anything more? Barbecues and cowboy shoes, gift cards and high gear. Now you're talking country, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times and Stroh's are spoken here. Stroh's, fire brewed for smooth, consistent taste. Now you're talking Stroh's, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times and Stroh's are spoken here. Bobby, it's almost 10. And I used to think the hockey life was fast, at home and away, 80 games a year. But at the end of the season, you had five months to unwind. Today, I don't have five minutes. Be right back. The Bay Banks card. It's good at Express 24s wherever you look, at money supply machines in stores and supermarkets, and at Cirrus locations from here to Hawaii. No wonder it's the number one bank card in Massachusetts. You can rely on it. Thank you very much. Oh, may I have a receipt, please? Can I have your autograph, please? Sure. The Bay Banks card. What are you waiting for? 23 to 7 as we begin the second half and Eric Facey kicks it off a high end over ender and it is taken at the 18 yard line and returned out to about the 25 by Doug Haynes. These are the halftime stats and Will as we take a look 19 first downs to 8 17 through the air for Rhode Island. 
315 yards total offense to 132, and 288 came through the air. Well, that's the only stat you have to look at is the total offense. It's all what happened in the first half. 315 to 132. It's a complete domination on offense by Rhode Island. 32 yards passing for Rich Bird, and Rhode Island has the football. First and 10. First possession of the second half at the 25-yard line. Linebackers drop back. Morris moves the ball to the 27. Now, Will, we had a strange play ending the first half. What happened? Somebody let the clock run out. Well, yeah, at the end Somebody of the wasn't first, doing their first job. half with about 15 seconds uh, left to play, there was a penalty call which stopped the clock. It was a personal foul against New Hampshire. Uh, they set the ball up in the one-yard line, half-yard line. Then they let the clock run again. Unfortunately, Tom had the quarterback for Rhode Island, was out of timeouts. He should have lined up and threw the ball out of bounds to stop the clock again, but he didn't. And they ran out before the time ran out before they get the playoff. At the one yard line. Right now, this is second and seven. Earhart to Brian Forster at the 45 and out to the 47. So Forster picks up where he left off in the first half, and Tim Tevens and Eric Thompson are back making the play. Well, Forster is making up for lost time after not playing last week, and there he gets a slap on the helmet from teammate Bob White. This is about the fourth or fifth completion to Brian Forster today on this very same pattern. He comes through the zone. He gets in behind the linebacker, but Earhart throws it on time before the deep people, the secondary men like Eric Thompson, can come up and react. First and 10, 46. Earhart looks to the near side, has Damian Riley, makes the catch at the 42. Nice. They say he's out at the 43. Ted White is right on top of him. That's a tough catch this to make. Is, uh, and a very discouraging play for New Hampshire because in the first half, they left Stan Harrison, number 12, out here all by himself to try to take this play away from Damian Riley. Obviously, New Hampshire adjusted and said, hey, we'll get Ted White out there. We'll put him in front of him. And what does Earhart do? He throws it over Ted White to the sideline for another completion to Damian Riley. And another first down. This one at the 43-yard line. Blitz. Earhart launches it for Riley, and it's overthrown. Well, he saw the blitz coming at him. Linebackers on Frelly and Duggan were both coming at him. And Paul Boulay was putting a lot of pressure on. So now second down, 10 yards to go. Well, this uh, is obvious. This might be Custer's last stand here for UNH. They've got to do something on this series to prevent the Rams' offense from moving. Already down 23-7. Earhart, a familiar scene, and this time he is brought down by Ilya Jaruschuk. Nice job by Ilya coming in from that left end spot, and he puts Earhart on his back. Well, it's the second time today Jaruschuk has beaten the, the uh, running back clean. Gets around him, makes the play again from the blind side. Earhart just gets a peek at him at the last minute. He learned his lesson the last time somebody hit him from the blind side and put him out of the game. That's right. Third down, 19. 13-18 remaining third period. Earhart drops way back this time. Screen pass to Haynes, and he mishandles. And a penalty marker is down. This could be a holding call coming up. Mike Jensen was the man that the flag was thrown at. Let's see which way it's going. Well, I guess that's it. The umpire calling it. Would you decline the penalty and take the fourth? Oh, yeah. You, know, you, you have to take the ball right here. Have to take the ball. Uh, New Hampshire needs the ball as much as it can get it in the second half. And you, you're down on the scoreboard like this by 16 points, and you haven't moved the ball very well at all. You want it. You've got to try to make big plays with it. I don't think New Hampshire can afford to stay conservative in the second half. I think they're going to have to throw the ball, even though normally they don't like to throw it. Well, the big play in the first half came off the punt. The fake punt. Let's see what Donnelly does this time. He's punted the ball twice, 44 yards, and this time he'll boot it. And Eric Thompson waits for it at the 20. Fair catch called for and down at the 21. Make sure, make sure he give you a nice fair catch signal that time. That's right. He, he stuck it up there and times. waved it. All right, coach. You're down 23 to 7. You've got 13 minutes left here in the third period of play. Burns got to put it up in the air, although he's going against the wind here. Yeah, he's got to throw it. He's got a very strong arm. We mentioned that earlier in the year when we saw him against both BU and Doppin. He has a very strong arm. What he doesn't do, and what he didn't do well in the first half, is pick out the right receiver. 
This time he has a lone receiver split to the left side. Pitch goes to Perry to the right, and he slices his way out to the 28-yard line. Well, Perry has been the workhorse today. Tim Poland finally pulls him down over there. Pickup of six. Perry, 21 carries, 108 yards. So for the sixth time this season, all six times he's played, he's got over 100 yards for the game. Well, it helped him today when he reeled off a 40-yard run on the first play of the game. That's certainly, that's off to a good start. Second down and four. Ball at the 27, hand off to Schreiner. The fullback pulls his way near the first down out to the 32. And it is good for a first down. Jim Landry and Pat Lawson making the tackles on the play. Jim Landry is nicknamed the animal because of his haircut. What's his haircut look like? An animal. <laughs> I don't know how you exactly describe it, Will. I guess the nickname has to say it all. First and 10 from the 33. Pitch, Perry, near side. Gets around Carbone. And to the 40. Charles Watson takes him down. And Tim Poland is also over there. And there you have a look at the New Hampshire sideline. And now Glenn Matthews comes off the sideline and brings the play in and relays it to Rich Bird. Bird had run for 202 yards and five touchdowns coming into this ball game. I don't think he's carried the ball today. He's let Schreiner do it here. And Scott Perry. Schreiner gets close to the first down before Damon Hewlett and Mark White can stop him. It is good for the first down. Oh, they're moving the ball. Well, they've made a commitment to stay in the ground. Now, they obviously think that they can take it up and down the field three times in the second half and score points because, you know, when you get, you're battling the clock, it usually isn't uh, that wise to run the ball all the time and chew up the clock. First and ten. Burn into the pocket. Pumps, throws the bomb. It is caught beautifully at the 15-yard line by Bill Farrell. Wow, what a catch. What a catch. Ray Williams was defending on the play. Ray Williams got a surprise because I think Ray Williams was playing coy in this play. He was sort of just laying back and said, go ahead, throw it. I'm going to pick it off. But it's such a good throw, and he throws it out in front of the receiver that it gets a long completion, and it gives a big spot to New Hampshire. Here he is. Watch Bill Farrell go up, extend himself right over Ray Williams. Williams has the coverage, but when the ball is thrown where it is, he can't make the play. 40 yards. First and 10 from the 16. Schreiner looks like he almost has a knee on the ground. And he gets the call and is met right at the line of scrimmage at the 15. Brad Carson is there to make the stop. Well, I'm not exactly sure what Schreiner was doing. He turned around and looked back at the clock. Maybe he felt they were using too much time. And for him to get down on one knee is really taking a low profile. <laughs> That's He's true. Well, five, eight, and nine to start with. Normally, a back would get up if he wants to take a look at the uh, defense and see what the defense is doing. In that position, you know, the one setback, he might want to look and say, hey, where are the linebackers in this one? I'm going to carry inside. I want to get a read on where they are. And he it's second down. down. He just and simply knelt down on one knee and sort of peeked around, and, and uh, he got up slow. Second and eight now. Ball at the 13-yard line. UNH trying to punch it in after the long completion of Farrell. Byrne wants to throw plenty of time. Finds his man. It is caught. Touchdown to Flanagan. Tom Flanagan, the tight end, makes the reception. And UNH puts another seven on the scoreboard. Another six with a chance to make it seven. Running. Tom Flanagan was standing in the end zone all by himself. And Byrne kept looking to his right. Now watch Byrne. He'll turn around. He'll look downfield. He looks to his right. Looks to his right. Flanagan's over here on the left. He's uncovered. Finally, Byrne sees him. Here comes the ball. Watch this. Nobody around over there. They say, where is everybody? And finally, at the last minute, Byrne saw him. The important thing right there was the great pass protection given by the offensive line of New Hampshire. Eric Facey to attempt the extra point. It's good. And with 9.59 remaining in the third period, Burns' touchdown pass to Flanagan makes it a 23-14 ball game. 
Here he is back to pass. You can count it off yourself. Look at the protection. He's looking all around. Most of his receivers are to his right. Now at the last instant, he looks back to his left. There's Flanagan, wide open. The nearest guy is five to six yards away, and he was just coming back across the field, Ray Williams, because he had the coverage on rubber shot all the way across the field. Well, different outlook on this one, and you have to wonder about the missed touchdown opportunity at the end of the first half. That may not come back to haunt the Rams. Oh, or they could have taken a field goal right there. Exactly. Yeah, they could have sent the field goal unit out in the field while the uh, penalty was being discussed, knowing, hey, as soon as the ball's in play, we'll snap the ball and we'll kick a field goal. There's a tight shot of Eric Facey. New life on the New Hampshire side. 9.59 remaining. Jerry Williams takes it to the four-yard line. 15, 20, up to the 22. On the sideline, Will, we see the outstanding linebacker, Neil Zonfrelli, he has an ice pack wrapped around, wrapped around his ankle. He won't be back. Seven plays on the scoring drive, 79 yards, three minutes and 10 seconds off the clock, and the 14-yard pass, making a 23-14 ball game. All right, the Rams line it up at their own 22. Earhart to throw. Launches the bomb for Riley over his head. Earhart is decked. Good pressure bag. Well, there. if I had to take a guess right here, what happened in the New Hampshire locker room at the halftime is this. We can't stand back and defend Earhart. The only time we really get after him in the first half, we pass rushed him. He threw interceptions, he turned over the ball another time, so therefore, we're gonna pass rush him. Because New Hampshire in the first half played five defensive backs at all times. Now they're in there, they get people up in the line of scrimmage, and every play this half, they've been rushing the passer. That was Neil Zonfrelli on the sideline, and boy, wouldn't he love to be in there, but his ankle in an ice pack. Earhart throws, the pass is caught by Tony DiMaggio at the 29. It's about a yard short of the first down, so it'll be third and one. Oh, the Rams working with the wind at their back, although the wind has been strange shifting around here. It's kind of coming almost directly across the field instead of end to end. Rams lead at 23-14, 9.44 remaining third period. Brian Morris, the solo setback. Earhart, Forster, 45, down to the 47. Eric Thompson finally wrestles the big guy down, but not before the Rams have another first down. What confidence these two have in each other. Earhart, the Foster, what a combination. No matter what the situation, they're not afraid to go with it. But that's his ninth catch today for Brian Foster, the tight end, for 133 yards. We're barely into the third period, playing against the best past defensive team in the country at this level. He came into the game with 1,048 yards and five touchdowns. He's had two touchdown passes today. And Tony DiMaggio makes the catch down to the 44-yard line. They say he stepped out of bounds at the 44. Scott Curtis defending on the play. Well, that's one thing when you build your entire offense around the pass, it ignites so quickly. You just complete a couple of those and it really turns the game around. Well, as much as any team you're ever going to see Rhode Island just isn't going to run the ball. They get third and six inches, third and <laughs> yard. They don't care where they are in the field. They can be on the other team's one-yard line. They try to throw it. It's an interesting concept. Griffin says, hey, we treat the pass like the run. Other teams treat the run. It's hard to, to change that frame of mind when you're so hooked into the, uh, the establishing the running game. But when you have a guy like Earhart, that's the only way to go. I am really surprised at what has happened here in the last few plays to, Rhode to New Hampshire. I mean, they come out and they rush Earhart, they force them to throw the ball away quickly. It looks like they got something going. All of a sudden, they got him in third and nine and they back off in his own. Boom, he goes out and he gets the first down. They didn't rush him uh, in short yardage situation there. He hits Forster to coming across the middle. I think by this point, they would have to commit themselves to coming every play. You're right. And Earhart now will 25 for 44, 352 yards. 
9.15 left in the third period. Second down and short. And there it is, the throw. And Damian Riley down the near sideline, incomplete over his head. Stan Harrison was right with him down the near sideline. So that'll come back now, third and six inches. Good down to play with. He's been trying to get the ball to Riley down that sideline, but just hasn't been able to do it. Don't throw the ball across to him. That's the play. Third and six inches. That's a nat natural. Play. Natural. <laughs> Instead of running for it, they'll throw it to the tight end. Well, now, you were the UNH offensive coordinator the first half. Have you shifted gears here? Let's see what happens. No, because he's really in this position. He's got two right. downs to do it if he wants to. Third and short. Doug Haynes, the Toss. setback. Here's the pitch out. Haynes has the first down inside the 40 to the 39. Well, when in doubt, go to a running play, right? Well, I've, if Doug Haynes has played, been in the game eight plays, He's been involved about six times. That's right. In other words, it, it looks like they don't put him in there unless he's going to do something. He's run three draws. You know, when they got him on the field, they use him. When he's out of there, I guess that's when they throw the ball. Bill Bowes on the sideline looking things over. It's a first down for URI, leading 23 to 14. Wildcats trying to fire up on defense here. Prevent further damage, but Earhart has other things in mind as he passes on the left side. Tony DiMaggio is at the sideline, makes the catch. Scott Curtis wrestles him down at the 31. Second down and four. A second and short four with 8.43 remaining in the ball in the uh, third quarter, I should say. It's been a long third period. A lot of offense by both teams. UNH got back in the ball game with the touchdown. Now the Rams moving. Earhart, the handoff to Haynes, bounces off one man and slips and falls down. Well, Haynes just was like a rubber ball bouncing off of that, that mass of humanity in front of him. And may have picked up a, some yardage, maybe the first down if he hadn't slipped and fallen down. So third down at a short four. Or a long three. You pick it. 23 to 14 the score. Earhart looks things over. He'll throw for it. Pumps once. Launches the ball. And it is incomplete. Now down there was Bob Donfield and Tim Tevens. Both going for the ball. And Donfield bumped Tevens out of the way to get to the ball. Yeah, there's a collision here, but you notice Tevens, when you picked up the pitcher, had turned the wrong way. Then he tries to reestablish his position. Both of them have a little shot at getting the ball, but I think the official said incidental contact. They were both throwing the ball. There certainly wasn't a, uh, an overt violation by either one of them. Fourth down, and the Rams are going for it. At Why the not? One. Sure. <laughs> Fourth and a short four. Earhart to the left side. Donfield steps out of bounds to the 27. Does he have it? He should if they spot it at the 27. Yes. Make it the 28. It is a first down. Got it by about a yard. Bob Donfield, there you see him coming back to the huddle. So the drive is alive. 7.59 remaining third period. The sun just breaking the clouds for a brief moment. We've had a little wind, just a little bit of rain, very little sunshine this afternoon. First and 10. Earhart to throw. Pass to Forster. He's got the ball at the 11. Whoa! What a catch by Brian Forster. He caught that like a loaf of bread flying out of someone's hand up against his shoulder pad and fell down with it. A great play all around by Rhode Island because Earhart does get some pressure up the middle. Watch it, just before he releases. But he steps up, gives himself a little room, throws the ball, it is into coverage because you watch, they get people around Brian Foster, but he makes it get, watch the way he holds on. Pulls the ball into his chest, gets down to the ground with it. We have a Wildcat down on the field, Will, who made the tackle. There's Brian Forster getting the congratulations of his teammates. That's Teddy White, I think, but he's back up on his feet. Oh, uh, Stan Harrison, I think. Yeah, it is. Is it Stan? I think it's Stan, right. They have used both White and Stan over at that side. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, if it was Teddy, he was having a 
a tough two minutes because they just pulled him out a few minutes ago and chewed him out <laughs> on, the, on the previous pass to Foster. But Harrison's played a marvelous game today, number 12. He really, Certainly has. He's been out there most of the game man-to-man uh, -man with Damian Riley, and that's not an easy task. Obviously, the pressure on the entire ball game. Rain kicks up now. First and 10. Earhart looking to the left side. Plenty of time. Now launches the ball grabs. to DiMaggio over his head out of bounds. Yeah, good play by Earhart. He had nothing in that. that was a, he threw it away on purpose. He just hauled off and said, hey, I'm going to get this out of, the, out of the end zone so I don't have any risk right here because he was having pressure and none of his receivers came open. Well, Will, the rain has picked up. We can see it now as we look to the scoreboard. 7.34 remaining in the third period, 23 to 14. And now it's a second down and 10. Jim Pratt comes into the ball game for the first time this afternoon at the wide receiver replacing Donfield. Earhart shouts him out. Second down and 10. Back to pass. Launches the ball for DiMaggio. It's incomplete. Tommy took a tumble, too, after re releasing that one. The pressure was on. Ilya Jerustek again, 46, had an outstanding game for New Hampshire. This time, instead of coming from the outside, he delayed and came from the inside. He came right up the middle, had a clear shot at Earhart, who released the ball got rid of it before he wanted to and that ruined the play that ruined the chance for the completion third down and ten Rams already had a fourth down situation and capitalized to keep the drive alive now they face third and ten from the 13 Earhart throws the ball it is incomplete for DiMaggio again so he goes for DiMaggio three straight times can't quite get it there Ted White defending on the play and now it's fourth down, and Mike Griffin comes into the ball game, and he'll attempt a field goal. Now, Griffin, five for six in the field goal department this season, as long as it was a 40-yarder. And this time, the ball will be down at the 24. He already has one field goal this afternoon. That's the 24-yard kick. So actually, now this season, he's six for seven. Ball is on the tee. The kick is up, and it is... No good. Off to the near side. Well, when you're that soccer-style kicker, it's tough when you're on this side of the field to get the job done, Will. You didn't have the hook on it. No hook. You know, normally a soccer-style kicker, we kicks it, it will come right to left. Watch the follow-through. Now, the kicker in the hole, the generally tell you before anybody else, they say, uh-oh, see you later. He knows it's gone, grabs his head. He doesn't want to go back and look at Dad, so he looks at the ground. <laughs> That's tough when you have to go home and face that. Wonder what they're going to talk about at supper time. New Hampshire now, first and ten, and no running room here. Well, the Ram defense has really had an afternoon. Pick one, up a five on the play, second and five. Yeah, one problem Mike Griffin uh, wouldn't have, you know, most kids play high school to college ball, and they go home, and their father said, well, what did the coach say to you after the game? That's true. In you, their house, the coach knows what he said to him after the game. Get it from the horse's mouth. All right, here's the pitch to Perry. And he moves out to about the 30-yard line, but he's uh, maybe two yards short of the first down. Tim Poland makes the play. Scott Perry, who has been the workhorse this afternoon, 24 carries, 122 yards. And there you see, we're getting some rain here, and the Come on, off that! New Hampshire fans. New Hampshire the takes it up the field here, Ken. Gets a score, puts it in the end zone. We're going to have some fun in that last period. That's right. 6.29 remaining here in the third quarter. Hand off to Perry. Tries the outside. Slides to about the 33-yard line. Mark White. Jim Landry was in quickly on the play. So second down and seven yards to go. Ball is at the 33, and it's getting kind of dark out here. Have to put spotlights on the receivers. <laughs> Good thing they started the game at one o'clock. That's right. Red Spurn hand off to Perry again. This time he's greeted at the line of scrimmage by Tim Poland, and the red shirt junior pulls him down. Poland makes an outstanding hit, but he pays for it. He hit him he sure does. head on. Hit Perry head on, and he's shaken up now. The referee Tony Chambers stops the game, and Poland goes down on one knee to clear his head. That was a head-on shot right at the knees he, he staggers himself 
but it was that when you hit a guy head on like that, you feel it right down to your toes. But when he got up, he staggered as if he was going to join the New Hampshire huddle, and then went down on one knee, and he's being attended to. 5:40 remaining in the third period, 23 to 14, and the rain is increasing here. Our New England College football game of the week next Saturday brings us right back here to Meade Stadium. The Rams hosting Northeastern live at 1.30. And I'm sure these people will not be tuned in to us, Will, but we will be watching from their balcony one more time. If they have to pay for those seats. <laughs> well, I don't know what is tuition these days. Standing room only. <laughs> will and I will be here for all the action next weekend. Rhode Island Northeastern here on Nesson where we deliver. Glad you're with us today. Third down and Blitz five. coming. There it is. And in on top, oh, Byrne gets away from it. What a run! Out to the 37-yard line. I thought there was absolutely no way he'd get out of Pat Lawson's grasp. Todd Tennell was also there. He was rushing. Well, we said Rich Byrne, 19, has great athletic ability. Pat Lawson blitzes. He slides off Byrne. Byrne comes up the field. Watch the spin and move. Gets away from another tackle. Lawson's trying to take him down from behind. He can't get in. <laughs> Look at the cut inside by Charlie Watson, number 40. Comes up field, tries to spin away, but he comes up about two yards short of the first down. Now New Hampshire's in a punting situation. And a 34-yard average for Tom Flanagan. His fifth punt, 33-yard average. And they can't quite get organized in time, Will. They have to call a timeout. Now, they used one timeout. They didn't want to in the first period. Now they use one here with 4.42 remaining in the third quarter, unless they have maybe a, a fake up their sleeves? No, it's uh, just a case of one of their kids. In this situation, Jim Bumpus, the uh, offensive left guard, come off the field for some reason when he should be out there in the punt team. That's him with his head down in the front line. It just <laughs> clasps his hands together in anxiety. He doesn't want to go back and look at Bill Bowes. He get out there too late, and his teammates looked around and called timeout because they didn't want to get penalized five down. Neal's on Frelly being handed the crutches. He wants to get up off of that ankle, and there you see it as he moves forward to the sideline. There is a tough kid. Yeah, again, like we mentioned before, the, uh, the start of the game, how tough it had to be for Garen, who's their best offensive player, to sit it out. Now, probably this year, most people would say Zon Ferelli's their best defensive player. Now, he gets hurt in the game and has to sit it out. So really a, a long day for the New Hampshire uh, coaching staff when they have to think about two of their best players being out with injuries. Flanagan's punt is taken by Bob Donfield on the fair catch. And now it's URI taking over again with 4.35 remaining in the third period of play. We're having fun here with the uh, wind kicking <laughs> Hey, catch these statistics that they happen to fly by, Will, will you? <laughs> I, I was joking with you before the game. I'm going to leave you, or, or maybe I'll stay home next week to see which one of us is causing all this bad weather on these Nesson games. You know it. Earhart. All-out blitz coming. And he has his man, Damian Riley. <laughs> you saw Brian Forster over there. He wanted to go for it, but pulled back at the last second. And Riley caught it right in front of Stan Harrison. Another first down. Everybody's committed. This man-to-man -man coverage in three areas down the field. Earhart comes back, reads it, throws the ball along the sidelines. Usually he will go to Damian Riley in a situation like this along the sideline on a hook pattern which is very difficult to intercept because the receiver is coming back towards the line of scrimmage. First and 10. Clock stop at 4.30. Here's the pitch out to Haynes. Cuts back inside. 45, 40. Still on his feet. Breaks it. 30, 10, 5. Touchdown. No, he's out of bounds. Out of bounds at the two-yard line. Paul Boulay finally knocked him out of bounds at the two and what a run, Will. He saw the field well as he was going down. Yeah, we said whenever they've had Haynes in the game, they give him the ball. Here they give him the toss. Looks like he's going to be stopped right here at the line of scrimmage. Then he cuts it back up through the hole, gets away from 98. There's the big break. Paul Brule cuts it, takes it to the outside, and runs 50 yards. It looked like he's going to go in the end zone. Watch the coverage coming over, looking over his shoulder. Finally, here comes Stan Harrison, who's been great all day, spins him around. The official says his foot stepped out of bounds. And they got the ball at the one-yard line. 
and first and goal. Brian Morris is the single setback. Long count. Earhart will throw for it. Rolls. Still looking. Launches it at the last moment. Incomplete. Well, that time Earhart couldn't really find anybody open, so he just decided to throw it into an empty zone. That's right. And that's what a veteran quarterback will do. He knew there was nothing left for him. His receiver went down at the goal line, the one he was looking for. Then he stepped back up and tried to take one more look. Knew he was running out of time and just threw it away. Second and goal from the two. 23-14, URI trying to pad its lead. Hand off Morris, touchdown! Brian Morris, the opening right up the middle. Mike Jansen, Jim Dos De Prospero are the two men that open up the hole. And that was big enough to drive a truck through. Well, New Hampshire might be one of the few teams in football history that played pass defense on the goal line. They still <laughs> only had three men in there. Normally, you'd bring nine men in, you put them down, everybody hits a gap. It would be very difficult to run a play like that, but they're so committed to try to defense the pass against the Earhart that they still had the three-man line in there. Mike Griffin will attempt the extra point, barefoot and all. It is up and good. 4-12, remaining in the third period of play, 20 to 14, your, or 30 to 14, your eye takes the lead. Looking right at Earhart, look at the blocking right here. He's into the end zone before anybody can lay a glove on him. He just steps right in there and bang, touchdown. Brian Morris. And there we go again with the push-ups down there. Steve Storr was the man leading the charge out there, really made the key block to spring him in. Morris from two yards. One of the rare rushing touchdowns of the season for the Rams. 30 to 14 is the score. Now the official brings it out and hands it to Paul Stringfellow. Stringfellow is from East Providence, the senior. Paul Stringfellow to kick off Rhode Island. Was the number one kicker a year ago. But Mike Griffin has done the job this season. Look at the way he's got that uh, his kick and shoe taped right up. Yeah. Point of it really sticking right up in the air. You can see the plates. And this one comes down to Tim Tevens at the eight yard line. Twenty. Oh, what a stick! But Tevens gets away to the 25, 30. Tim Tevens pulled down to the 33 yard line. What a run back! Need a couple touchdowns. The scoring drive, four plays for the Rams, 67 yards, 23 seconds, and uh, the two-yard run by Morris, capping it off. Great well, run back here, wow. Well, this is the defensive player of the year in the Yankee Conference last year, Tim Tevin. He bounces off Carbone's tackle, takes it back to the outside. Ray Williams, number one, stays with him all the way, but he can't hang in there. Steven steps inside, but then the whole gang shows up and said, hey, that's it, enough's enough. And Burns wants to throw, and the pass is complete to Tom Flanagan on the near side. And Flanagan is pushed back to the 36. Flanagan making that nice catch, which set up the UNH touchdown in the third period. And made it 23 to 14, but the Rams have come back, striking on the two-yard run by Morris. And 30 to 14 is the score with 3.34 remaining in what has been a wild afternoon of football. High formation, Perry gets the handoff. Cuts back inside over the 40 and out to the 41. Damon Hewlett, who his teammates say looks a lot like Jim Plunkett. He's taking a lot of ribbing for his Plunkett look-alike. Makes the stop on the play. If you can play as long as Plunkett, who cares what you look like, right? And with the, his success, like to play on two Super Bowl teams. That'd be nice. Third down and three. 2.57 remaining in the period. Rich Byrne takes to Schreiner, pitch out Perry. Tries to turn the corner, does. Gets over the 45, out to the 47. Nice run by Perry to get the first down. Brad Carson makes the stop on it. And Tim Poland is there. I think that's the first option pitch of the day, isn't it, Ken? 
that's first one, one I can remember. Yeah, that's yes. been one of their big plays for them in the games we've seen this year, and this is the third time we've seen them. They've used that option pitch. But they, here we are in the third period, and that's the first time they use it again. again. Probably another illustration of how Rhode Island has tried to defense them to the outside today. Fake handoff, option play as Byrne rolls over the 50. And will be brought down to the 47 by Mike Cassidy and Mark White. Mike Cassidy. Well, Byrne came into the game rushing for 202 yards, hasn't run the ball a lot. But there it gets good yardage and sets up a second down and four. Interesting thing, Bob Griffin says right now, considering that Garen is out of the out of action, Scott Perry's the best running back in the conference, he feels. Schreiner, the best fullback. The two of them are in the I formation. Here's the pitch to Perry, rolling right. Perry, the using ball Schreiner, but can't quite turn the corner. And Bill Maker is there to put him down at the 47. Well, Maker's had himself a great game today. 133 remaining in the period. Third down and three. Bill Farrell now brings the play in from the sideline, and Glenn Matthews goes off. Perry, 28 carries, 140 yards. 30 to 14. Rams lead it. Ball at the 46. Third down and three. Everybody up. Isn't that the truth? Now the linebacker shifts back. Byrne rolls out. Gets by Cassidy. And finally brought down to the 44 yard line by Mark White. Well, Cassidy contained him. Number nine contained him on the attempt to go outside. Cut back inside, and Mark White brought him down. And they'll bring the chains in from the sideline. And look who's the last man up again Mike Schreiner. Well, I think uh, no matter which way this measurement goes, they got to go for it on fourth down. Right. It is fourth down. The score position on the field even if they haven't got a first but they do have a first so they don't have to worry about it there you see still the would have had to go for a minute left in the period trailing 30 to 14. new hampshire's got to think points so a first and 10 from the 43 final 54 seconds now of the period off to Scott Perry who lunges forward to the 38 yard line. I have stopped at the 40 and simply lunged for an extra two yards. Carbone and Lawson making the hits. So many times today, Perry seemed to be a step away from making a real big run. Right. You know, so many times today, a good six or seven times, he accelerated through the hole and it looked like he might get 10, 20, go all the way. And then he stopped after, for one reason or another, usually by the Rhode Island pursuit, five or six yards up the field. Perry straight up the middle, down to the 32. And Bill Maker puts the hit on him there. But it's good for another New Hampshire first down. And there's a player down on the field. Slow to get up. Bumpus. Jim Bumpus, the outstanding left guard. This guy's on the Dean's list, a 3-7 average in English. 17 seconds remaining. He'll probably critique one of our replays, either tonight or on Monday. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock is the Nesson replay of this game. And 11.30 on Monday night. Byrne takes the handoff, rolls right, and brought down behind the line by Mike Cassidy. At the 35-yard line, Cassidy ends the third period with a big defensive play. And that is the end of three periods of play with a score. Rhode Island 30 and New Hampshire 14. Stay with us. In a couple of days, a new company will be born here. Started by someone with a deep-rooted faith in the American dream and a taste for plain hard work. Well, the Wall Street Journal believes in the American dream, too. But they also believe that achieving it takes more than hard work. It takes hard information. So the Journal gives you the business information that can make your work pay off. News, insights, trends, practical ideas you won't find anywhere else. Well, the Wall Street Journal is a partner. Starting a business can be a little less risky and a lot less lonely. 
Call 800-336-1111 for this new journal offer. 13 weeks for just $28 with a money-back guarantee. 13 weeks, $28. Phone 800-336-1111 now for the Wall Street Journal. The fourth period of play, Bird almost slips and falls down, fires the ball to Robichaud, who drops it. That'll bring up a third down and 12. Come on, folks, where is going? Keep it up. Ray Williams was defending on the play, but Robichaud simply dropped it. 30 to 14 is the score as we pick up action here in the fourth period of play. Ken Bell with Will McDonough and our Nesson crew. 14.55 remaining in the ball game. New Hampshire would love to get a touchdown to get back in the ball game. Third down, 12. Fake handoff to Perry. Byrne, flag is out, a flag is down as Byrne is hit at the 33-yard line and pushed back by Brad, Pat Lawson. Lawson has been all over the field today. This possibly could be a holding call against New Hampshire. There's Burn back to pass. He looks upfield. He sees an opening and says, hey, I can take off out of here and get 12 yards. But he, he's greeted in a hurry because Pat Lawson comes up and contains the play and makes the hit and shoves him down. But I think behind the play, they grab number 67, the center, Paul Default. He's the one they threw the flag at, anyway. And they're going to catch him for holding, and uh, Rhode Island's going to take the penalty. Or it could Force be John Driscoll. Anyway, a holding call along that front line. So it's third and 12. I'd refuse it. Uh, brings up a fourth down if they do. But they're going to take it. Well, now the officials are talking things over with Mark White. Defensive captain, number 36. Yeah. yeah, see, White obviously got, got the word from the coaches because he walked over and said, no, we want to refuse it. Now the New Hampshire bench and Bill Bowes is yelling out, hey, you already mocked it off. They can't change their mind. Tony Chambers, the official, said, yeah, we can. Fourth down and 12, Will, at the 35-yard line and no other choice. New Hampshire's got to go for it. Crowd comes alive. Looks again. Burn to throw. Over the middle. The pass is knocked away. Yes, yes, and there is a penalty marker on. Pass interference. Carbone was right in his yeah. face, did not turn around to look should back at the ball. Yeah. But he jumped in his face, and I think he made contact, even though the ball hit him before the ball got there. Take a look here. Here he is. Burn back to pass. He forces this throw because there's coverage. Carbone got the coverage here. But watch the play. Carbone, 17, will be running with his back to play. See him reach out and grab the receiver while the ball was on the way in. And that's what they, why they're going to call the interference, because Tom Flanagan was there. Carbone thought the ball was coming out, reached with his left hand and grabbed him by the shirt, and that's when the flag came out. And the 15-yard walk-off and the first down on, at the 20-yard line. Good call by the referee. 14:32 remaining in the we have, we have to say good call when it's a good call don't we? We should do it. It was a good call. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we have to point out when officials make mistakes, but we certainly want to point out too when uh, make a tough call like that. And the replay really bears it out. First and ten now from the 20. Rubber shot is to the near side. Here's the handoff to Perry, up the middle, has running room to the 11-yard line. Well, the Never, Day, Never Say Die Wildcats are still putting the charge on here. Jeff Barlow pulls Perry down in that backfield, but Perry just rips off another seven yards at second down and three. Well, it's 30 to 14, another score would make it 30 to 21. And still 14 minutes remaining in the ball game, anything can happen here. Rams defense, of course, has other ideas. They try to tighten the grip. Second and three. Schreiner has the first down as he moves the ball to about the seven-yard line. Jim Landry makes the stop on him. You know, Schreiner reminds me of a pinball. He'll just bounce off anybody. He'll find the opening and bang, bang, bang. Goes for the yardage. Well, he's also tough to see if you're a linebacker. 
you know, he's not that big, and they have big offensive line in New Hampshire. And once they straighten up to block, it's tough to pick him up to see where he is. Good point. First down and goal from the eight. Perry. He's wrestled down by Jim Landry, a gain of about a yard. That'll bring up a second down and goal from the seven. He's starting to limp a little, Ken. Uh-huh. Starting to limp. That's the first time today I've been waiting to see if it was going to happen, you know, because he did have such a severe ankle injury that earlier in the week they had him on crutches last Tuesday, and they babied him all during the week in practice. But yesterday he came out and ran and ran well, so that's why he's starting here today. 33 carries on the afternoon, Will. Second and goal from the six. Byrne fakes the handoff, wants to throw, gets pressure, Goes launches it for the end zone, and out the other side. Well, it went through the uprights. Bill Maker putting the pressure on. So that brings up a third down and goal from the six. That was a strange play because that when was. he rolled after the fake pitch out, he had Flanagan open in the end ready, zone. Stand. Maybe he didn't see him. Maybe there was uh, somebody in his way between Byrne and Flanagan because, you know, as soon as he looked up, I said to myself, hey, he's going to throw it out there to Flanagan. Then he brought his arm back down, and then he got the pressure and had to throw it away. Glenn Matthews brings the play in from the sideline. Now Perry is a slot to the left side. Single setback is Schreiner. Rover shot on the near side. And Byrne rolls to the left. And lofts the ball for Schreiner incomplete. Now Schreiner, I think, wanted him to run the ball. That's right. <laughs> Byrne thought he says, throw me the throw ball. Me That's the what ball. they're talking about right now. They were out there. He had two blockers in front of him, Byrne did. One of them was Schreiner right here, 31, shaking his head in disgust. He says, come on, run with us. We'll take you into the end zone. But when he put his hand up and brought it down, Byrne must have misinterpreted and said, hey, he wants me to throw the ball. That's why he tried that little basketball flip. But it doesn't work. I mean, it looked like he could have run the ball in the end zone. Here comes the play in from the sideline. Bill Farrell brings in word from Bill Bowes. Big play, fourth down goal from the six. Crowd responds. Rams send everybody up on the line. Byrne wants to throw. Throws back. It is incomplete. The pass intended for Tom Flanagan. Flanagan had the football in his hands wide open. Couldn't make the catch. Tough luck. You can't see it, but Flanagan's coming off the line of scrimmage to your right. Now, Byrne will go back. Flanagan comes downfield. He will be held up by a defensive back. Wants to go to the out. Spins into the inside. Now you're going to pick him up. Watch him. 81. He's alone. Doesn't look the ball into his hands. Had his hands out there in position to catch the ball. It's Doesn't slow to get it. up. Look over here. Bird is it. slow to get He's up. He's out there. Should take make this catch. The ball is right in his face mask. In fact, it goes through his hand and hits his face mask. Bounces away. That kills the drive. Big break for Rhode Island. And here is Byrne, who took a lick after he threw it he coming sure off did. the field. Byrne was slow to get up and had to be helped off the field. He is really taking a pounding here. Well, the Rams take over. The defense holds. It's first and ten. Ball at the five-yard line, just outside the five. Here's the pass to Damian Riley. Turns it upfield at the 21. More breathing room and another first down. Riley goes over and has a word here to say to Bob Griffin. What do you think about coaches who wear sunglasses when the clouds <laughs> on a cloudy day? I'll tell you, those are his regular glasses, and they're the, the kind when you walk into any room with light, they're going to shade. Oh, I think it's great because you can't tell what he's thinking. You can't look in his eyes. <laughs> can't look never get, the only time he got excited all year was at the UMass game. 408 yards now in passing. 30 for 55 for Earhart. Gone over that 400-yard mark again. Here's the handoff to Morris. And he carries to the 24. Ball is loose, but I think the whistle had blown. Yes. Paul Duggan, or Dave Duggan, I should say, makes the uh, play. Now Tom Earhart is doing some quick work on the sideline. I, I don't mean on the sideline, but uh, to one of his teammates out there. Repair job. Yeah can do it all. Very hard to throw. Over the middle, Tony DiMaggio pulled down at the 30-yard line by Scott Curtis. And another Ram first down. 
11.53 remaining in the ball game. Rams with an eye on that automatic berth into the NCAA playoffs by winning the Yankee Conference. Coming in now 3-0. New Hampshire 2-0. Winner of this game, definitely the inside seat and perhaps clinching. 30-14 is the score. UNH has yet to play UMass. Last game of the season. That'll be a big one. There's the handoff up the middle. Brian Morris breaks it and moves it to the 38-yard line. Dave Duggan pulls him down at the 38. Dan Federico is also in on the play. Well, New Hampshire and, U and uh, UMass will be a big game. Assuming that Rhode Island holds on to the lead and goes through and wins the conference today with this victory, gets the automatic berth. That becomes a big game, UMass and New Hampshire, because there's still an at-large berth. Right. And the two of these two teams, UMass and New Hampshire, if they go the way they've been going, will very, be very much in the running for that berth. Second and four, handoff Morris again. Morris carries. And out to the 39. That'll bring up a third down and about two. The by number you, you know why they both get a lot of consideration? Because when the committee has to look at their season this year, they will see that UMass really played very, very well. That's right. When they had Palazzi, their quarterback in the lineup, you know, they've only lost one ball game with them all year, and that's to Richmond, the number one rated team in this division, and only by five points. They'll say, well, we got to give them consideration. UMass going with its uh, second and third string quarterbacks when they played the Rams earlier in the mud. Earhart over the middle, the pass to Forster is complete at the 44-yard line, and another URI first down. Scott Curtis wrestles the big guy to the ground. Forster, who holds the NCAA records for a tight end in a single game, a season, and a career, came into the game as the national leader by any receiver, 10.1 catches per ball game. And on the other, conversely, with New Hampshire, the committee's going to have to look at this game and say, hey, well, listen, Garen did not play against right. Rhode Island. If the Wildcats are fortunate, he'll be back next week. Oh, Haynes what takes a, a stick. stick. Wow. Scott Curtis right there. Scott Curtis, 6'1", 215-pound sophomore, leaves an imprint <laughs> on eight. <laughs> wow. Second and nine, pickup of a yard. 30 to 14 score. There you see lost the yard and you give Scott Curtis. Bill Bowes, you heard him on the sideline say, hey, you lo he lost a yard and you gave him one. He almost lost a few ribs. Nine ten remaining in the ball game. Earhart hands off to Morris. Quick hitter up the middle. That oh, to the 47 yard line before he stopped up and he gets a good six on the play. It'll be second and four. Dave Duggan makes the stop. Well, you've seen a little more of Earhart than you've been able to see in the last two appearances. Will, what do you, how do you evaluate things this afternoon? Well. Statistically, he has had great games here in two years, but I think when this one's over, this might be his best hour, his greatest performance for Rhode Island, because you have to consider who he's playing against today. True. It's, it's Foster again, the number one rated defensive team in the country the against country. the pass. New Hampshire coming into the game, and he's thrown for over 400 yards against them. And it's not because it's any fluke. New Hampshire has great players on there in defense. I bet their secondary with Tevens and Thompson and White and Harrison is as good as any at this level in the right. country. It really is. They got four outstanding defensive backs back there. And still, he, he cut them up. He throws for 400 yards in a big game. So I think this got to be his best performance in a Rhode Island uniform. Good point. And Forster, 12 catches, 159 yards. Hand off to Morris. And he moves it inside the 40 down to the 39, and he is gang tackled by Duggan and Tim Tevens leading the charge. Well, the linebacker's been playing well all afternoon. Here's Duggan. Here's Duggan. He's just happy he doesn't have to chase Foster down here, which he's been doing all day. Makes the tackle head on. Now, Tim Tevens, number 10, come in. Now, watch Tevens go for the ball. See him reaching in there. He'll pull the ball out eventually. See that? But the referee said, hey, we already blew the, uh, the whistle. Once the running back was in the grass, they'll forget it. We're giving the ball back to Rhode Island. 30 to 14, Rams lead it, facing a second down and seven yards to go. Hand off to Morris. 
Rams turning conservative here, just hoping not to make a mistake. Dave Duggan is there, and keep the clock going with 7.17 remaining in the contest. Also, Dan Federico is in on the play. Well, Neal's on Frelly, the outstanding linebacker, sideline in this game with an ankle injury. Andre Guerin has not played. UNH scarred here with injuries. Hard hitting game. Third down and two. Earhart drops back, pumps, launches the ball for Riley. Riley can't get there. It's incomplete. Almost picked off by Eric Thompson. Nice play by Thompson. Makes a great reaction. He's playing center field in his own defense. Harrison and Damian Riley, like they have been so many times today, were in a man-to-man -man situation along the right sideline. Yeah, Erhard threw the ball a little higher that time than he normally does. He got a different kind of a trajectory on it. Thompson reacted and got over there. Now, Harrison might have pulled the ball out of his hands. But Harrison reached back like he wanted to make the play. He reached in, and all of a sudden, the ball seemed to snap out of Thompson's hand. And a timeout is called by the Rams. We'll be here next Saturday for Nesson's College Game of the Week as the Rams take on the Northeastern Huskies. You see Tom Earhart over on the sideline talking things over with Bob Griffin. Bob Griffin was telling me at the beginning of the season in that Delaware game that a pro scout was in the stands had come to watch three players in the game. Took one look at Earhart throwing warm-ups and said, forget about it. I'm watching nothing but Earhart in this ball game. I think he's going to attract some attention in the pro, pro ranks, don't you, Will? He will definitely be drafted. Uh, and we were talking, uh, get with a passing-oriented team, he could really... Yeah. He has to because, you know, he, won't, he wouldn't run if they had a gun in his head. He just refuses to run. He's always looking to throw. That's what they want him to do. He's got excellent size. He's a big kid. He's got a nice arm. Uh, what he will bring to pro football faster than most quarterbacks uh, in the country is the knowledge of the passing game because it's been taught to him and drilled into his head now for two years. This is a pro passing attack. Bob Griffin put it in September of 1984 for Tom Earhart. They've worked at it for two years. So he knows what the game is all about from the passing aspect before he'll get to the pro game. And he directs him down a fourth and two. Throws the ball over the middle. The pass incomplete. And UNH will take over. DiMaggio, the intended receiver. And Duggan and Jeruschuk were both on his back and prevented the catch. Nice defense and the turnover by... Turnover to the uh, Wildcats. 6.36 remaining in the ball game. Wildcats have got to launch the ball. They have to move it down the field in a hurry. Trailing 30 to 14. Yep, they're back in the I formation. You know, that's when you commit to an I formation, that it's very difficult to play from behind. Limiting your options here as Byrne wants to throw. Pass is complete. Pass and that yes. is pass and yeah. Pat Lawson. Well, there wasn't much question about that. He wasn't playing the ball, and he wrapped him up, put a ribbon on him before the ball even got there. Yeah, Byrne rolls to his right. Scott Perry is running back, come out of the backfield, went through the line, circled out to his right. He's coming across the field, but Pat Lawson, 15, just before you get a look at the ball coming through, had hooked him with his left arm. Watch Lawson, keep him out of the... You see him on the right side of your screen. Watch him reach in and hook with his left arm. It's behind the receiver. You can't do that. That provides a first down at the 40-yard line. 6.31 remaining in the ball game. Byrne takes the draw to throw. Left side. Oh, nice defensive play. Pass intended for Robichaud. Damon Hewlett got his hand out there and batted the ball away. But at this point in the game and with the score on the board the way it is, you're behind by that many points. You say, what are you throwing the ball three yards down the field Short, for? Right. Let's get it up the field. You know, you need big plays when you're behind 30 to 14. You get six minutes to play. You've got to get three scores one way or the other. So you better make some big throws. It's second down and 10 now at the 40. Second down and 10 for New Hampshire. Burn. The 40. Over the middle. Pass is caught by Farrell. And he is put down at the 42-yard line. Bill Farrell. Mike Cassidy nails him at the 42, but not before he gets a first down. Pat Lawson came in and really put the rush on. 
Take a look at this. Watch the hit on Billy Farrell here. This is a nice throw. He goes up the field now. Sees Farrell coming across. Watch the hit. Mike Cassidy gets him from the front, number Ooh. nine. Watch it, watch it. Flip him over, boom, and ah. there's the elbow from Pat Lawson to finish it off. Farrell, two catches, 58 yards. He tries to make another catch. This one is incomplete. Actually, this is Flanagan, the tight end. So it brings up a second and 10. Ball at the 42-yard line. It's one of those licks and the chops that you'll remember for a while. <laughs> this next week might be a little sore. And you also remember you not only caught the ball, but you held on to the ball. That's right. 5.59 remaining in this one. 30 to 14. UNH trying to dip the scoreboard. There's the rush by Lawson on the blitz. And he sacks Burn, the quarterback, who is slow to get up. And look at the Rams celebrate. And Burn gets shaken up again. Boy. He really took a hit. He was blindsided. No way you could see Lawson coming in. Well, this is the design of the play and inexperience of a quarterback. Nobody watch coming out of the left-hand side of the screen. Bang! Nobody hits Pat Lawson. That is the third time today he has gotten over there and came in clean, and really nobody's gotten a look at him. Second down, 28 yards to go. Scott Perry to the 48. Damon Hewlett drives him back. And he's all worked up. Well, that'll bring up a third, uh, fourth down, rather, and 22 yards to go. And you need points. 4.55 left, and the punt team comes on. Well, I wonder if they're planning fake here or if they actually intend to punt. Well, that's their punt that they got back there. That's Flanagan. Six punts. I mean, if I'm going to go for it at this point, I'm going to go for it with my passer and all my offensive people on the field. Why try to get clever? You just may, go, may as well throw it, but instead they're going to kick it. Ball dribbles into his hands, and a fair catch called for by Donfield. Let's ball go over his head. It rolls all the way into the end zone. The wind came up at the same time and knocked it back, and a penalty is down. A marker is at the 35. Massachusetts beats Connecticut 21 to 7. Fourth quarter, Boston University 17, Richmond 7. 17 to 7, Boston University. Harvard 25, Brown 17. 25 17, Harvard. BU beat Richmond? Right. Isn't that's, Richmond the number one ranked team in this that's, division? That's right. That's unbelievable. That is. That is what incredible. an upset. Wow. <laughs> oh my God, Steve Sterling. If that is the right score and that's the final, that's a major, major upset for BU today. Richmond undefeated, isn't it? Going into undefeated, the game? right. Undefeated at number one. Dartmouth and Yale tying 17. All those are a few of the scores. Boy, that BU thing, that is big. Because a lot of what the committee does at the end of the season depends on where you fin finish in the final standings in the national poll. Here's the pass to the right side and out to about the 20-yard line as the rain kicks up again. Brian Forster is the receiver. Oh, the, <laughs> the wind and the rain start coming at full force. And the fans start going. We talked about this earlier in the year, and I know coaches don't like to hear about it, but would you have Earhart on the field now? I mean, you know right. you wrap this up with a, with a berth in the playoff. You got, you got postseason play within your grasp. You got your quarterback out in the field. Get him you out know of a there. very good defensive team, New Hampshire, is going to be frustrated at this point in the game. They've been out in the field. It's been a long day. If somebody gets a shot at them, they're going to take the shot out. There's the handoff. The right side, and Brian Morris comes out to the 21-yard well, line. That'll bring up a third down. Dan Federico is the man making the play on that far side. Brian O'Neill is also there. O'Neill playing the entire game with that sprained neck. About three and a half minutes remaining in the contest. Some of the fans start to head for the exits. Well, it was billed to be a classic, and really it's been an outstanding ball game to watch. 3-10 remaining. Penn State beats BC. 
third down. Here's the hand again to Haynes, and he's nowhere. Jaroszczuk wraps him up. That brings up a fourth down and eight yards to go. And Bob, or Jim Donnelly, will come in to punt the ball away. You know, there'll always be the question when people think back in this game, uh, what would have happened if New Hampshire had its great running back, Andre Guerin. And I feel bad for Rhode Island that that question will sort of linger because they have dominated this football game today. And in a way that people didn't think was possible That's to right. score on New Hampshire the way it had. Now, all these points by the Rhode Island offense have been legitimate. They have no setups. It isn't like, you know, hey, our offense fumbled deep in our own end and we didn't have a chance. You know, Rhode Island made the plays to get the 30 points. They took it down the field. So there's one phase of this game that's been dominated, and that is the phase that's been controlled by the Rhode Island offense. That won the ball game today. All over you. And again, you look back at that fake punt in the first half. It really said a lot about this game. Burn to throw the bomb. Triple covered out there. Ball slapped up in the air a couple of times and incomplete. Well, Todd Tunnell was back there. And Mike Cassidy was also there. Charles Watson triple teaming Tom Flanagan. Flanagan, the tight end, running deep. And Curtis Olds comes into the ball game, bringing in the play from Bill Bowes. And he can back out to the wide receiver slot right over. It's the first time we've seen him all day. Maybe we'll put a little bit more speed in the lineup, seeing they want to throw the ball deep at this stage of the game. Burn back into the pocket, second and ten. Over the middle of the pass is caught by Bill Farrell. He takes a hit, hangs on to it. Damon Hewlett hits him at the 39. And that is a first down. He takes a double pop on this one. His burn going back, looking downfield, sees Farrell coming across. Randy Roca, 28, is going to be there. 58, Damian Hewlett's going to be there. And he gets it both sides. You'll see the pop Ooh. right there by Randy Roca, up high. But Farrell, the second time, he's taken a terrific shot, held on to the ball. 155 left in the game. First and 10, over the middle of pass, caught by Robichaud. Inside the 15, down to the 12. Mike Cassidy pulls him down at the 13-yard line. They'll spot it at the 13. And it's, again, another first down with a minute 49 remaining in the ball game. It's good that Mike Robichaud, 20, catches this ball because about the only opportunity he had all day dropped the ball right in his hands. Here he makes a nice catch coming. The best thing he did there is break away from uh, Charlie Watson on the play because, uh, you know, all day long, two people who have been outstanding for Rhode Island, a number one, Ray Williams, cornerback on one side, and Watson, Charlie Watson, cornerback on the other side. They have stayed out there all day long and played man-to-man -man defense on the, U on the uh, New Hampshire wide receivers, and that allowed them, Rhode Island, to play nine men against the run. If they couldn't do that, if they couldn't handle that coverage man-to-man, -man, okay, they wouldn't be able to commit nine men to the line of scrimmage to play the run. So the ability of Williams and Watson allowed Rhode Island to do that today, and they have done a masterful job at it. They certainly have. Final one minute, 49 seconds of the game. URI has got a lock and a Yankee Conference title, mm -hmm. and most likely the automatic berth into the NCAA playoffs should they win that title. Next week, Northeastern non-conference game. One conference game remaining, that against UConn in the season finale. Two weeks from today. And that's also here at URI. Last four games of the season, all right here. Pass to the right side. Schreiner has it to the five. Touchdown. Mike Schreiner. Well, I... I have to say he's deserving of getting a score the way this man plays. Well, he plays all day. He beats people up. He knocks them down. He's a blocking back. I, New Hampshire finally finds a way to beat the blitz. <laughs> they let him slide out of the backfield. He runs by the defensive end who come in. Damian Euler takes the ball, goes upfield. Nobody's there. Eric Facey will attempt to, uh, or they'll most likely go for two here. Got to go for two. 30 to 20 is the score, as you see on your screen. And Byrne calls the play. Two-point conversion attempt. Have it pull them with an eight. Split backfield, went back right side is Schreiner. Byrne wants to throw, lofts the ball, and it is caught out of bounds. Out of the end line. 
and is caught by Mike Schreiner, who scored the touchdown. But the score remains 30 to 20. Too bad they could have had a little fun. <laughs> could have had a right. little fun of that two-pointer. Would have been like the old Harvard Yale game where the you know onside kick recover, go for an eight-pointer. <laughs> there is Burn rolls back, Schreiner tut catches the ball, beats the blitz, he's up the field because they committed all the linebackers to the rush. That left it wide open for Schreiner to make the catch and go in for the score. Got to see an onside kick here by uh, New Hampshire. Absolutely. 148 remaining in the ball game. And Rhode Island responds by putting all its uh, people that should have good hands out in the field. I see Damian Riley. Everybody out there has got a low number. Who's a wide receiver, a defensive back. Jim Pratt. DiMaggio's Carboni, there. You know, all the receivers. Yeah. Foster's Forster. right in the middle of right the front the line. All the people who would normally practice catching the ball, your receivers and your defensive backs are out there looking for this, so. Awaiting the official's whistle here. Everybody in the See, stands gonna, knows. Oh, here it they're goes. They're going to shift to the other side and try to make it bounce. Oh. And the Rams recovered. Almost didn't go 10 yards before it was touched. Randy Roca. And URI has got it. First and 10 from their own 49-yard line. Scoring play. Four, uh, four plays on that drive and 52 yards on the march. 216 off the clock. 13-yard pass to Schreiner the capper, and the two-point conversion fails. <laughs> DiMaggio says, hey, where is it? Went right through his hand. We were talking about the sure-handed people being up front. Here's the pitch to Haynes. Comes over the 50-yard line. And just into New Hampshire territory. Scott Curtis is a man making the stop. Well, the Rams have two games remaining. Both of them home games. Barring any bad injuries, uh, this team looks like it might be ready for the playoffs. Sure, I think what uh, Bob Griffin will do now is just anybody that's banged up a little bit, try to rest them, rest get them ready for the playoffs. That's still about a month away, I think, because you get two more games. Don't they generally have one week sort of off between the time you finish your regular season? A lot of teams get a bye, too. Yeah. Uh, and they, you know, they could by uh, winning the Yankee Conference. Big thing I I'd like to see is... New Hampshire and UMass play for an at-large berth because I think in view of the, of the injuries that both of them had that kept Palazzi, the most important guy in the University of Massachusetts offense, their quarterback out of the lineup for several weeks, and now Garen here in a big game today, kept the big players out, give them a shot at it. They both got good record. I think it would certainly help the Yankee Conference today when VU beats Richmond, the number one ranked team. In, in the country at this at this level they got to pay attention to this conference say hey they got some pretty good teams up there so they're certainly worthy of an at-large berth hand off to morris down to the 48 i think the way it works is the top four teams in the poll who are invited to the playoffs get a bye that first week so uh, chances are the rams would be would be in action that first week of the playoffs but again Wait till you wait to uh, Rhode Island after you see what Rhode Island did That's to right. BU, and then Richmond goes up to BU, and uh, BU, if our score is right here today, puts it on them pretty good, then you've got to pay some attention to this team. Well, New Hampshire came in 14th in the country. Rhode Island was 17th. So there you've beaten the team higher in the rankings also. Third down and seven. 58 seconds remaining in the game. Hand off to Morris straight ahead. And New Hampshire wins a timeout. 51 seconds left in the contest. That brings up a fourth down and five. That was final well, on the other hand, UNH now with that game against UMass in a couple of weeks. And UNH plays at Maine next weekend. Maine's had a rough ride this year, losing again today. There's Andre Guerin on the sidelines. And what he must be thinking, as Will mentioned in our pregame, game of the career for this young man, and he can't be in it. Fifty-one seconds left in this one, 30 to 20 the score. Tom Earhart is still in there. Philly. 
down and by for Rhode Island. He'll throw for it on fourth. Has DiMaggio. He makes the grab at the 28. Great catch. <laughs> That's a terrific catch. Ilya Jaruschuk is there with him, but DiMaggio makes the grab, and he seems to be favoring his side as Looks he goes like off he his might hip. Have got a hip pointer, his left hip. He releases from the line of scrimmage. Jaruschuk, the defensive end, goes with him. Turns around, rotates his body around, catches the ball one-handed, pulls it into his body, but now you can see him reaching down with his left hand and immediately grabbing his hip. 35 seconds left in the game. Earhart shouts out the signals. And drops to a knee. All they wanted was the first down, a chance to run out the clock. With 22 seconds, it will continue to run. Now the two teams shaking hands. And what a football game we've seen this afternoon. But URI proving its superiority here in the Yankee Conference Game of the Year. 10 seconds. This will run it out. Bob Griffin on the far sideline, a happy man as his team heads for the center of the field. 12,000 fans watch this one. Earhart, 35 for 65, 446 yards on the afternoon in the airwaves. And we'll be back to summarize what happened here this afternoon. Again, the final score, Rhode Island 30 and New Hampshire 20. Ford Dealers present 8.8 .8 Plus. 8.8 .8 annual percentage rate financing on 86 and 85 Tempo and Escort. Both when equipped with manual transmissions. Plus tough new 86 Rangers and sporty 86 Bronco 2s. Plus a special lease offer on all 86 and 85 Ford cars and light trucks. 1986 is off to a great start with 8.8 .8 Plus. Rise and shine, cast your line, catch the limit here. Now you're talking fishing, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times, and Stroh's is spoken here. Stroh's, fire brewed for smooth, consistent taste. Now you're talking Stroh's, now you're talking beer. Now you're talking good times, and Stroh's is spoken here. Madison presents Major College Football 1985 as top 20 teams from the Southwest Conference, Big 8, and Pac-10 battle for the national championship. Join us at the 50-yard line for all the college action featuring USC, Notre Dame, SMU, Washington, UCLA, Texas, and more on Nessus, your New England sports network. It's Washington State versus USC in college football action on New England sports network Sunday, November 3rd at 11 p.m. Nesson, your New England sports network, has the best in professional boxing with Tiger Eye Boxing from the Sands Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. You won't want to miss the hard-hitting excitement of Tiger Eye Boxing every month here on Nesson. Join us Tuesday, November 5th at 10 p.m. for live Tiger Eye Boxing here on Nesson, your New England sports network. Ken Bell with Will McDonough. We have just watched the Yankee clash of the season. URI beating UNH 30 to 20 in what should wrap up the automatic berth into the NCAA playoffs, depending on what happens in the final game against Connecticut and what UNH does with UMass. Yards passing, 461 for the Rams. Earhart, 446 of those, 35 for 65. UNH, 153 yards, 10 for 26 for Byrne. Forster, 13 catches, 159 yards. Earhart, 35 for, that is 35 for 65, right, in the 446 yards. Three touchdowns, two interceptions, and Perry had 34 carries for 159 yards, the top ball carrier in the game. And we were looking at Earhart's statistics here, and uh, another impressive showing. Well, it's the second highest number of completions he's had in the game. As high as 40, and this is 35, so this is the second. And his yardage of 446 is the third highest in his career. But what happened here today is the cream uh, went to the top. When you needed it, when Rhode Island needed it, Earhart, their great passer and Forster, their great receiver, came through and made all the big plays. And I, I'll say it again because I think it's important. We mentioned it during the broadcast. But this has to be his finest performance for Rhode Island 
playing this way against New Hampshire, an outstanding defensive team against the pass, a very tough defensive team, a team that gave him his most problems so far at Rhode Island a year ago, and he came back and showed them this year they couldn't confuse him, they couldn't discourage him, he stayed out there the whole ball game, was a little shaky at the beginning, he looked like he was a little pumped up, but once Earhart got in the groove and got it rolling, he was right on the money most of the afternoon and dominated the game. The final score, 30 to 20, Rhode Island. A giant step toward the NCAA postseason playoffs and the automatic Yankee Conference berth. Be sure to join us next week for more exciting New England college football as we return here to Mead Stadium on Saturday afternoon at 1.30. It'll be Northeastern taking on URI on Nesson's College Game of the Week. And stay tuned for tonight's Boston Bruins action on Nesson 7 o'clock live from the Garden. The Bruins face off against the Chicago Blackhawks. Our live coverage begins at 6.30 with Bruins Digest. The executive producer of New England College Football's Game of the Week is Bob Whitelaw. Isolation director, Ed Placey. Coordinating producer, Mike Baker. Statisticians, Leo White and Bill May. And the spotter today, Stephen Kopech. Thanks to the Nissan crew for another outstanding job. For Will McDonough, this is Ken Bell saying this has been an exclusive presentation of Nissan, your New England sports network, where we deliver. <laughs>